So this is the longest one he has. Is the live stream going, you guys? Yeah, I'm starting. Oh, so we can start. Wait. <clears throat> I see that camera. Do you want me to just start and then they can just pop in when it's ready? I'm going to just start making pop in at the end. Okay. All right, now let's get started for the morning and we'll just go. Okay. All right. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience. We're just working out a few issues at the live stream. I hope everyone had a chance to grab some breakfast, coffee um, throughout the morning. Um, it will be available in the multi-purpose room, so feel free to help yourself and take care of yourself that way. Uh, I want to welcome you here this morning. Um, I hope you all had safe travels getting here. We appreciate you spending this day with us today. Um, I do want to um, welcome you to today's session, Learning Our Way. It's sharing our knowledge and experiences on conducting searches for unmarked graves. And it's presented this afternoon and this morning and this afternoon by Star Blanket Cree Nation and the Regina Indian Industrial School Committees for IRS Cemeteries. I do want to acknowledge this morning the prayers that were said as, as a pipe was lifted. We had a pipe ceremony here this morning and just want to acknowledge that uh, we started the day in a good way today saying prayers for uh, for all of our communities, for all of those that have been impacted and continue to be impacted by this work, um, past, present, and, and in the future. So thank you very much for that. I'll introduce myself this morning. My name is Michelle Brass. I am a member of Yellow Quill First Nation here in Treaty 4 Territory. I've been a community member in the Fort Capel File Hills area for more than a decade and uh, have known and, and have sat and visited um, and worked with many of you. So it's good to see a lot of familiar faces and I feel very honored this morning to be invited to be your MC for the day today. Um, my mother is a uh, a residential school survivor. I'm the oldest child of a residential school survivor. So, you know, the first generation uh, to not have to attend. Uh, my mother did attend uh, Muskaugan Residential School near Lestock for most of her from, from the age of six um, into her mid-teens. So for me too, this is very important work as it is for all of us. We all have a personal connection to the work that has being done. And um, so I'm sure it will have an impact on us personally, for our families and throughout our communities as we hear this knowledge and experience that is being shared today. Um, I do wanna bring your attention. We do have at the front some um, information. We have the agenda for today. So it's the poster that was sent out uh, that I, outlines what we'll be expecting to hear today. Um, as well as there's some information here for some support. If more support is needed uh, throughout the day or after you leave, please take that with you. We want to make sure that everybody is fully supported in our communities because a lot of the information we'll be hearing um, can have an impact on our hearts and our spirits and our bodies for sure. So we want to make sure that we all make sure everybody is, is held gently as we share this work. So this event is a result of current events that have been unfolding um, in many of our communities across Turtle Island um, for many years and in recent years come to light. Recently, Star Blanket Cree Nation's leadership, along with the search team, announced disturbing findings and, and shared them. Earlier this year, Regina Indian Industrial School began a third search on the west side of the existing cemetery and the associative committee awaits the results. So this is ongoing work with more revelations and more discoveries um, that we need to learn about and, and process and, um, and continue work on. Last year, George Gordon First Nation shared with the world the discovery as well of unmarked burials. So today is a result of the shared experiences by the search teams and the hope is to provide information to community members and more importantly, the survivors and family of survivors amongst us. 
So throughout the day, we will hear presentations from various people who have worked in different capacities on this work, share their findings, um, and we have the opportunity to ask questions, to learn, and to hold this work in a gentle, sacred way. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we will have a lunch break this afternoon. Um, and uh, just make sure to look after yourselves as we uh, go throughout the day. And don't uh, hesitate to reach out if you need any extra support. So with that, I would like to invite Chief Michael Starr to start us off with opening remarks. Now, Chief Michael Starr has served as counselor for the Star Blanket Cree Nation for 15 years prior to being elected chief in 2009 and is now serving his fourth consecutive term. He holds a professional director designation, a business administration diploma from the First Nations University of Canada, and a community programming diploma from the Saskatchewan Indian Institute of Technologies. Chief Star has worked towards economic sovereignty for First Nations. He serves as a director for the Saskatchewan Indian Gaming Authority, SEGA, one of the largest economic drivers for First Nations in Saskatchewan. He also serves on the FHQ e-commerce uh, Kisichuan Holdings and FHQ Casino Holdings Board. Forgive me if I mispronounce that. I'm Soto. <laughs> Not Cree. In this capacity, he is advancing a solar energy project and a greenhouse project. Passionate about education, Chief Star is committed to advancing educational opportunities and positive outcomes for First Nations youth locally, regionally, and nationally. Star Blanket Cree Nation is home to the First Nations University of Canada, a post-secondary institution founded by the 74 First Nations in Saskatchewan. Chief Star is dedicated to strengthening education systems and is a proponent for integrating the importance of honoring the treaties into curricula. Chief Star understands that sports, culture, and recreation contributes to a well-rounded leader and serves on several education boards, committees, and commissions. And on a personal note, Chief Star has always been so very kind every time I've seen him in the community and does incredible work, and we are very grateful for the work that you do. Thank you, Chief Star. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Michelle. I, I haven't been introduced like that in a long time. <laughs> I want to uh, start by uh, <clears throat> acknowledging our, our, our Samantu, our, our creator. And I want to you know, acknowledge our uh, pipe that was uh, said this morning as well. <clears throat> acknowledge you all, you know, for being here as well. And uh, acknowledge our Kateyak that are here. <clears throat> our Iskwisak is are, that are here as well, our women. Of course, our, our men that are here. <clears throat> we want to acknowledge that our our, our our teams that are here and both uh, our communities of white calf uh, and star blanket of course george gordon and the regina project indian residential school projects and uh, acknowledge the hard work that they're doing uh, the very emotional work that they're doing the necessary work that they're doing in our communities. When you uh, <clears throat> when you think about uh, the times that our that our old people, our our Kateak, our our Ogimals, our leaders began discussing the settlers coming over you know, to our area and they met. And wondering what they were going to do and how they were going to do. So they said prayers and, and did a lot of those uh, necessary ceremonies, including the pipe, lifting the pipe 
asking acknowledgement that way. And so began the journey of, uh, of the treaty processes, the treaty negotiations, if you will. And their understanding was to have that well-rounded education systems. The cunning of the white man is the way they understood it the knowledge that would carry them into the future. They thought that was important. But at the same time, they had, they wanted that understanding of our, our Neheo way from our, our nation's way and all, all nations that are in this territory, the Nakoda, Lakota, Dakota, the Shinabe. They wanted it to carry on and continue on with our languages. And as we know, we lost a lot of that in this territory, in the South. So our ancestors wanted it that way. They wanted a balanced lifestyle for our young people. But we all know it didn't happen that way. It changed and it shifted. Changed and it shifted to the Indian Act legislation that was pushed upon our nations. And unknowingly, you know, for our our ancestors, our relatives who didn't understand English at that point in time. They were being told that they were taken into a system, the residential school system, where they would learn the cunning of the white man, the Englishes, the, the languages of English, the math, the sciences, all those necessary things they thought at that particular time. How do we farmers, how do we good citizens, if you will. But it didn't happen that way. Instead, they were forced into devastation, hardship. And as we come to understand it, sometimes life's taken. Some didn't make it home. And impacted a lot of our nations and in, in our Treaty 4 territory and beyond, and beyond in this region and across Canada, as you understand it these days. <clears throat> so that's the work that our, our communities are starting to do. And as I indicated, it's an emotional. It's hard on our hearts and hard on our minds. But it's important work. So, as I indicated before, the ones that are here doing that work, you know, some of you are here. Today, we, we said some good prayers and, and, and offered you, you know, some some ongoing healing that we require and need, not only in this, this process and in, in this area, but all areas. From our perspective, our nation's perspective, more so in, in white calf, you'll hear the work that we're doing our understanding, it was the last residential school across Canada. It was closed in 1998, and it was demolished in the year 2000. And as a young leader at that particular time, trying to understand and work through that, it was very challenging. I always think about those days and 
think about that beginning of the work of working with, uh, with our community. And as I started to engage and, and, and listen and learn, and one of those processes was the White Calf Collegiate. My responsibility at that particular time was education. And so it was pushed, if you will, not pushed, but given, I guess, given to me that responsibility. But at that particular time, we had an effective leadership, I believe, and, you know, and we did the best we could. We changed the things that we could change in that institution at that particular time. We felt that we had taken care of the things that we started to understand going on there. So we changed it to bring back our ancestral way, some of our understanding of our culture and our languages, but at the same time still learning the contemporary ways of, I'll say it like that, and, and that's what we did. So moving into the, after we demolished it and, and we continued to do things there, um, our community wanted us to just leave it alone a little bit. And we didn't understand why at that particular time they didn't want us to develop it into you know, possibly land leases, possible cabins. You know, we, we did that work because it had, it was close to the waters. So we had those plans, but we were told from our community not to do those kind of things. So we listened to them. Unknowingly moving into time and the things that have happened that there, that way there. And when we talk about it today, those are our understandings that we feel it was necessary to leave that area alone. We did a few things there. We were starting to, to do, to build uh, food capacity, to build our food capacity. We were starting to do gardening. So we had a, what was it? I can't remember the, the name of it, but a grow house or, or a, kind of kind of a greenhouse, but it wasn't necessary. I guess you can call it a greenhouse. But anyways, that's what we did a little bit. And then as we understand it, the 215 unmarked graves that were located in, in British Columbia initiated and started that work as well. So our nation took it upon ourselves to listen and learn and we visited and we, we were taught and by sharing as well from the community of Kausas, we met with their team and did the work that was necessary. We even visited their community and what they were doing. So it helped us, it helped us build our, our team the things we needed to do. And as you hope you'll hear today, the different streams, I call them streams in different areas that, that we embarked on. Researching is one of them. And the challenges that come from that research that needs to be done out there. And they'll tell you a little bit of their visit to Montreal into the archives over there other areas that they want to do. And this afternoon, we're, uh, some of us are going to go into the Royal Canadian Museum, research some of those artifacts that are there in our communities. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. They'll tell you about the technical process of searching the grounds, 
the ground penetrating radar systems that we utilize, the anomalies that are found, the things we have to do to do those kind of things, to understand if they are persons or, or young people. And, and that's where it gets heavy. That's the work that gets heavy. And as you understand, and, and as you know, on January 12th this year, 2023, we made an announcement of a young child that was found there in the grounds of White Calf. The jaw bones of a young child from the age between four and five years old. And that brought a lot of emotion again to our people. And, and we have a security team there and it affected our security team and it still affects them today. And there's paranormal activity that happened there. And you'll hear a little bit about that. I've ex personally experienced that person, that paranormal activity. But we do our best to pray. We do our best ceremonially wise, respecting our Kateic and understanding what they want us to do. So we take direction from them. They give us direction. We do our best to manage through that. And when, when we made that announcement, we had briefings upon briefings upon briefings to help us. And some of them have resonated in me, in our team. One of them, this is not our fault. And this is not our fault. We're just doing the necessary work that needs to be done. The other thing is you have to be strong. You have to be focused. You have to be strong for the young ones that are could be still there. To find and locate them. We have to be strong that way. We have to be strong for our nations to help them. To help them understand. And I believe we are strong and we are resilient and we'll move past this, we'll get by this. And there's hope, there's hope in the things that are coming our way in our communities, some of our communities' ways. And one of them is a class action settlement just recently announced through the federal government in, in the court system with our nations of about 325 nations that have signed on. Our nation was one of them. I believe George Gordon was one of them. And a few other nations, if you have read that, if you Google it, you'll see who's all involved in, in, in that project. And it's a $2.8 billion settlement claim. As I said, there's 325 across Canada that signed on. And you had till June of 2022 to sign on that. And if you didn't, I'm not sure what's gonna happen in that perspective, but possibly another one on the other. I think that's about half of our, our nations across Canada. So the ones that didn't sign on in June of last year, then they're not part of that settlement, unfortunately. But the hope that it provides is to continue bringing back our ancestral way, bringing back our languages, bringing back the things that we need to do with, the, with our young ones, with our children, bringing back that understanding of our, our heritage, 
the continued healing and wellness of our people because of the things that are happening as we understand it today. So there's hope that we move to. And that's what we need to do. We need to focus on that as well because that's important. It'll lift us up. It'll help us. It'll give us strength in doing this work that we're doing. So those are my words today. And you know, I, I wanted to start off in, in my own language, but sometimes it doesn't come to you. You know, it, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't grasp sometimes. And sometimes it does, so I'm still learning. But I'll continue to, I'll continue to work, you know, with, uh, our uh, health in our prevention areas in our nation and we're doing that work the beginning of that work and as i indicated this opportunity that is before us it'll help us for the next 20 years so that's hope that's hopeful and that's helpful so i'll say that much today you know i acknowledge and, and you know encourage your strength when you're up here. And that's what we prayed on. And I encourage you know, to look after yourself. Take care of yourself. That's, you know, that's what we've been telling each other in our teams. I have my little, I was gonna bring my little wolf and I have a little wolf that we receive different techniques that are out there that we need to use. So I acknowledge that and I say welcome and have a great day as much as you can. Laugh, have fun too, you know, that's part of it, healing. Don't necessarily be sad and, and like that. Be happy. Encourage one another that way too. Thank you. Hi hi. Thank you, Chief Star, for starting us off that way for your remarks and um, and sharing all of that with us. And yes, you know, that focus on healing, on laughter, on coming together, you know, I, as I shared, being the oldest of a residential school survivor, uh, and, and all of us, all of us in our communities, none of us are untouched by, by this. Um, you know, there's a lot of healing and the impacts that we feel in our day-to-day -day lives, but I'm so grateful as well in our communities, how we do support one another, how we do have methods of healing, how we do have laughter so that we can hold sorrow and hold joy and continue to move forward in a good way for our children and our future generations. So thank you so much for that. So we're going to move on to our first presentation of the morning, uh, presented on behalf of the Regina Indian Industrial School Commemorative Association. And Sarah Longman will be delivering that presentation. Sarah Longman has been an educator for 30 years, working as a classroom <coughs> teacher, university instructor, consultant, and a supervisor of Aboriginal education. Sarah is currently the Director of Education for the File Hills Capel Tribal Council. She is the first child in three generations of her family to have not attended residential school. As a direct descendant, she vividly recalls the impact the residential schools has had on her family, her mother, and her older siblings. She has been a witness to the colonial impacts of intergenerational effects. Currently, she is the chair for the Regina Indian Industrial School Commemorative Association, which oversees the RIIS Cemetery in the city of Regina. Sarah is also working alongside her home community, George Gordon First Nation, to conduct its second round of searching for possible burials. For her, this work is the most profound and deeply meaningful work she is involved in and feels honored to do this work for our communities. And I feel honored to welcome her to share her presentation. Thank you. 
My goodness, we're readjusting here, readjusting everything here. Um, don't have enough space up here on this podium, and I can't even put my food up here either. So, I guess we'll get back to that later. Thank you very much um, for those of you that took the time uh, from your day to come out and and uh, hear our journey, um, to hear um, our experiences as we've gone. Uh, about doing this very, very critical, heartfelt work. I want to thank uh, the pipe this morning and the prayer songs and the prayers. Those are what get us through all of the work that we do as, as people who embark on this journey. And we can't, we can't do that work. We can't do this work without prayers. And I humbly ask those of you in the room, when you are doing your prayers, to keep keep the members that are doing this work in your prayers as well. Because as, as Chief uh, Starr mentioned, it's very difficult work on everybody that's involved. I want to thank my colleagues, my, my can I call you cousins from Star Blanket, um, for, for sharing part of their parts of their journey um, with us. And I know that uh, deeply, deeply honored to um, you know, have the have the conversations um, as as you know, both of our communities are going through uh, similar paths, and that's kind of how we support each other through this work. Um, as uh, Michelle had mentioned, this work is taking place right across Turtle Island, and I've had the wonderful opportunity to connect with other search groups as well. Uh, spoke with the Kamloops members, uh, our Kauses team, our Muskelgan team, our team at Star Blanket and uh, um, many, many other, other groups that are doing this. We share uh, similar stories of the heaviness of, of doing this work and carrying this work forward and, and the pressure uh, from our communities to find answers and, and, and the frustration in trying to find and piece together records that don't exist. Those are, those are some of the struggles that we have as we embark on this work on behalf of our communities on behalf of our descendants, on behalf of our survivors, on behalf of our families and communities. I have the absolute honor to work alongside the Regina Indian Industrial School Commemorative Association. It's an association that started long before I came along. And I think as, as it unfolded and, and time went on, um, there were many, many people that were part of this journey, that started this journey that began this journey and then just passed it off to the next group of people. And I think part of that is, is that's how it's meant to be. I think that's how this work is supposed to unfold, that we start and then we pass it off. Um, there have been a number of people that have been very instrumental in doing this work on behalf of the uh, RISE Commemorative Association. Uh, we've been fortunate to have some very positive allies that have done some critical work for us that we wouldn't have been able to do without them. So those people um, that are here, thank you so much for being here, being an ally um, and helping us to do this absolutely critical work and to move this along to where it is today. Could not have been done without you. We have had um, many lessons as we went through this work and we're still learning. Uh, so today is a day of sharing some of those learning with you. And uh, I also want to say, I'm, I'm going to apologize right now for those pieces of information that I may miss or those, those critical names of people that I may miss along the way. That is not intentional. There's just so many details to try to remember in a short period of time, so my apologies. The Regina Indian Industrial School was, was somewhat a little bit different from, from the residential schools. And the, the distinguishing difference, I guess, with the um, industrial schools is the industrial schools really focused a lot on trade. Uh, the industrial schools were built away from the First Nations communities, whereas the residential schools remained uh, on the reserves or, or very close to the reserves or were established in the reserves established around them. So the industrial schools were more of a trades-based kind of educational program. Uh, the students were still uh, taken from many, many different communities and spent sometimes their entire life um, up to a year in these schools. Um, so this one in particular, this is a picture of the building 
that existed just on the outside in its complete uh, formation after it was done with the garden and landscaping and it existed outside of Regina. The school operated for a period of 19 years from 1891 to 1910. Uh, the communities that were impacted by this particular school in a short 19 years were some of our treaty or, or some of our First Nations communities in Treaties 4, Treaties 5, Treaty 6, Treaty 7, Treaty 1 were all impacted by this particular school. This is an aerial photo uh, that we, we came across in some of our archival search. Um, and this shows the, the school and some of the, the vast area that it was built on. And this is absolutely critical when we talk about doing this work because it's not just the school, it's not just about the building, but it's around the entire surrounding area around that building. It includes the gardens, it includes the stables, it includes the out, outer buildings, it includes the residential buildings, the houses. All of that, those pieces are very important when we're taking a look at this. So in the case of the Regina Industrial School, we're talking about 320 acres of land, which is 6.4 kilometers in size. It's based, it's built on the where the, the Wascana Creek is, or if you're going there now, you'll go over that little bridge, there's a, there's a golf course, um, and then you'll go over that little creek. Yep, it's right in that vicinity area over there. Or if you're driving down Duty Avenue and you're familiar with the Paul Dojak Center, that's the same area pretty close to the same spot where the original building actually stood. So today, if you're driving down Duny Avenue, you'd see a bright red building there, bright red roof, uh, which is uh, Dojo Center. And, and the part that's really critical about this work is, is when we have um, uh, developments that are happening within that area of Regina, it's really critical that we understand the parameters and boundaries and the exact size of this area because there are so many pieces of this area, this, this 6.4 kilometers that has not been searched. And uh, the only uh, areas, as you'll see as I go on uh, with the presentation, you'll see the areas that have been searched and it's nowhere near 6.4 kilometers in, in radius. Uh, there's been a number of different uh, changes with this particular um, school along the way um, and certainly some of the obstacles that we've had to deal with and I know that when we speak to some of the members uh, with, that are involved with the Brandon School, they are also another one of the schools that's situated within a, an urban area and they have some of the same issues uh, that we have as well. So the property originally uh, was owned by, was originally Crown Land and then somewhere along the way it was transferred over to the province in the uh, 1970s. Um, after that, it became a part of a private landowner in the 80s who had um, taken and bought, bought the property in the area around the cemetery. If you take a look at this little picture here, that little red dot there is where the cemetery is um, over there. And then, of course, you can see Pinky Road uh, back there are the tracks over there. So if you're driving down, heading um, north on Pinky Road, you'll see some of these pieces here. Um, currently, this, this particular um, area is protected under the Cemetery Act which only uh, dictates that the grass is to be cut for us. So please don't expect, and I always say this when I'm presenting to a lot of people that are not familiar with the work, don't expect a cemetery with a great big sign and a manicured lawn and a whole bunch of wonderful headstones, because that's not what you're gonna see. You're gonna see a little overgrown uh, area of land uh, with, with, a, with a white painted fence and a whole bunch of over holes. <laughs> The Regina Industrial School attendees uh, came, as I said, from a number of, of areas here. So when we're talking about a school, uh, we need to understand that this school impacted a large area and included several, several, several different communities. So when we're being asked questions by our community members, survivors and descendants, we have to make it very clear that it's not about the one building, but it's about several, several communities that have been impacted. Um, so again, I missed some of the treaty areas when I first mentioned it, but Treaty 1, Treaty 2, Treaty 4, Treaty 5, Treaty 6, and of course, Alberta, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and then we also have um, some communities that are listed um, that are just on the other side of the United States border. So it's a very, very, very vast area of land uh, that we're looking at here. Uh, this was uh, one of the, I guess, one of the early indications here 
um, of, of something of, of deep interest uh, that took place in that area. And there's been a number of different stories that have been shared with me by people who have done this work prior. Um, but very a very significant landmark piece for us was this one particular um, little headstone uh, that was kind of overrun um, by the tall grasses there and the dilapidated fence. Um, and, and this uh, particular uh, gentleman here was well aware of the existence of this, this little headstone. Um, as we, as we, um, or as the folks at that time, when we say we, the folks at that time who were doing this work, um, this was this was a huge, um, a huge piece to to get us to to pay attention a lot closer to what was happening within that little area. So this is the one little headstone that you'll see uh, if you do go out there and have a visit at the cemetery. Um, this little headstone uh, provided, I guess, a, a pathway uh, for people to begin taking a closer look at what was going on. Uh, Chief Start mentioned doing some work with the archives, and uh, we were fortunate to have some folks from the Presbyterian Church do a lot of archival work for us and uncover some important pieces um, that kind of uh, put us in the right direction and, and set, the, set the work moving forward that's still underway today. So one of the significant pieces was an archival letter that was uncovered in the archives. The letter was dated November 14, 1912. And in this letter, it was basically a petition um, that was uh, sent to the government by a group of, of the church ladies. And they wanted to make sure that the, the cemetery or the headstone there was, was protected. And uh, in the letter, they had also indicated that there were several uh, Indian children who laid side by side with the children who were uh, buried under that uh, headstone, that one headstone. We are also very fortunate to have uh, find, uh, to, to be um, going into the provincial archives and came across this, this provincial ledger. Uh, this is an attendance book um, and it's in archival form right now. And we were able to uh, go through the archives and print a number of these copies off and it gave us a whole bunch of indications of who was in the cemetery, uh, the days that they were admitted, uh, which communities they belonged to, the names of their parents, their age, their birthdays, all of that really, really important information. So of course, if you look down the one side of the ledger, you'll see that there's numbers there. And those of you that are familiar with the history know that the names are changed and numbers were given uh, to students. Um, as well. So you can see some of the numbers on the side here, followed by the name, uh, the age of the students, how old they were, where they were from, which reserves they were from, also information about who their parents were. There was also a column that indicated which denomination they were <clears throat> as well. So this is very important information as people phone um, on a number of occasions and will ask us, you know, if, if this name exists on the register. So we'll go back and, and we'll find uh, that student's name. And I did get a call from a person a, a little while ago and said, my, my, my great will ship him to that school. Do you have any information about him? So I went back into this, this ledger of attendance and I was able to find this student's name, how old he was, how tall he was, the circumference of his chest, which is really important as well because there's another uh, big light bulb moment about other areas of accessing and looking at different files. Uh, so then when we share the information about uh, who, um, when his grand, his great great um, Shum came into the school, he was moved to tears because he never never saw his Mishum as a six-year-old boy. Um, and uh, so it was very important because then they were able to get the names of his parents as well. So we put some family pieces back together and you all know that one of the things that the schools did was totally decimated our family kinship ties. And that's really important as we do this work as well. How do we get those ties back by looking at some of this information? Archival information also indicated um, that there were some um, students that died within the school. Um, I, I don't think we found the exact list and again, I'm very, very cautious when we, we put numbers uh, besides this because I know that the archival information is not 100% accurate. It tells a part of the story and puts us on the path to find other parts of the story, but it's not the story in its entirety. So be very cautious when I say numbers 
Um, these are the numbers that are in the archives, and we know they're not 100% accurate, but they're what we're working with. So we've had uh, um, Dr. Doug Stewart uh, from the university who's done a lot of this work uh, alongside uh, some of our members of the Presbyterian Church to find some of these pieces of information for us that have been totally uh, important to do this work. So from the years 1891 to 1898, um, there were 51 students that died. Uh, we have really uh, limited uh, information about how they died. We do have um, some uh, records that indicate that some of them died from uh, consumption and some of the other issues that were happening at the time. But again, and to verify that information, we have no way of actually verifying that. Um, in 1898 to 1910, we knew that there were a number of, of students who may have passed away from, from tuberculosis. So very much like now we're dealing with the pandemic, there was also the pandemic that was happening back then was, was tuberculosis. Um, there was no indication as to where these students were buried um, or whether or not they were sent home. This kind of a vague, vague um, understanding. Um, our, our research um, began um, in, in 2012. So we were doing this work and it was really kind of under everybody's radar. It wasn't really a big deal in the news back in 2012. Uh, when this discovery was made. Um, as a matter of fact, there were a couple members who were greatly involved in our, our arts organization who took this, this uh, story and, and built a, um, a YouTube video, a video that's available on YouTube, sorry. Um, and Janine Wildoff is, is, is absolutely phenomenal and, and very creative and, and just a real qualifier. And she created a, a video called um, Rise from Amnesia. And if you look into YouTube, you can find her video. And basically, amnesia refers to the forgotten, this forgotten cemetery uh, that existed in Regina. So the first survey there, this, this is from the top, the little red square that you see at the top of the screen there, um, is the area where the McLeod children, who were uh, the children of one of the um, uh, employees at the school, the little black mark beside the red one there is that little, that little headstone. So this first result um, revealed that there were 29 possible burials that were identified and the three are encompassed the red square there. So you get to kind of see how closely uh, the graves were together here. With the help of, of technology, and this is something uh, I have to tell you when, when we started doing this work, very, very, I knew nothing about when GPR was. I knew nothing about EM results. I knew nothing about scanning. I knew nothing about satellite imagery or drone work or any of those things. And this is one of the pieces that, that I tell you, I have had to learn on the ground uh, running uh, because it's something I never ever in my life heard about before prior to doing this work. And uh, I'm learning as I go along and, and I, I'm uh, always um, I'm talking to some, some uh, archaeologists and different people that have the expertise and, and inquiring the questions about what does this mean, how does this work, so I can come back and share the information with my community so they have a better understanding as well. So ground penetrating radar, you've heard GPR, everybody's heard GPR, some people have seen GPR, other people haven't. It's basically looks like a lawnmower with a, with a, with a laptop or a, a computer screen on top. And what it does is it, it goes over the ground. And when I talk about it, I, I like this floor because this floor is like patches. It basically examines every little patch there to see uh, what is in the ground. So it's kind of like an x-ray of the ground. When it does find something, what it does is it gives a tiny pulse or like a tiny beep that there's something there. Um, I, I, I've stayed away from using that word anomalies on purpose because it, it's such a, a vague term. And people have started to associate that word with burials. And we're saying, no, 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 no. An anomaly means that there is something there. That doesn't mean that it's a burial. An anomaly could be a rock. It could be a tree root. It could be a piece of metal that's been buried. It could be a brick. Okay. So all this little machine does is it tells them there's something there. It doesn't tell them what it is. It just beep, something's here. Right? That's all it does. So it's quite limited, it's important, but it's quite limited in the information that it does provide. And it takes someone with expert skills to be able to go in and do an analysis of all of those little tiny beeps to figure out what they are. 
So it's kind of like when you go to the to the to get an X-ray. If you've had an X-ray before, there's the X-ray technician that takes the X-ray for you, but it's the actual doctor that gets those results and does an interpretation of what those results mean. Same thing with the GPR work. Okay. Um, so the little signal comes back to the computer, and then it shows a whole bunch of different uh, different um, images and stuff like that. So the one image that's up here is another one called EM. This is electromagnetic. I just sound like I know what I'm talking about here, hey? <laughs> the electromagnetic uh, um, instruments were also paired with, with the GPR work here. You can see how um, objects that are underneath the ground are located by this. So again, looking at that, that very colorful map there everybody in this room maybe maybe town might be the only one that kind of can interpret what that means the rest of us have, have no clue what that means that's why we need to work alongside with some experts to be able to de decipher what all that information means uh, so when we did uh, the results here you could see where the where the uh, little black squares there are where the possible results uh, were located we also did uh, did a little bit of work with uh, George Gordon First Nation, and we did our first round last year, and are heading into our second phase. And you know, those stops between the phase searches is for us to kind of get our bearings back again, because it is very, very heavy, emotionally heavy work, and we need to step back from it every now and then, and just take a pause, and just say we need to breathe, we need to regain our strength. We need to go back to our prayers, and then we need to come back to this work again. So that's why it takes it takes some time. This is George Gordon, and again, looking at some of the areas that we looked at here, um, the area A, uh, you can see the school there is a blue building. So those of you that attended George Gordon First Nation, um, you'll be familiar with the area. Um, but uh, those are, are some of the areas of interest. And again, when we're talking about areas of interest, those areas are so difficult to, to pinpoint. Um, what we did with George Gordon is we spoke to a number of, of survivors in the community, people that had stories, people that have heard stories. So lots of descendants come forward and share the stories that they've heard from their grandparents or their parents. Based on those stories, if there's a continuous pattern of a certain something happening within a particular place, and that happens over and over again by people that are in different provinces who really don't know each other, it kind of gives us an, an idea that there's something. Um, so here's some of the areas that were identified, some of the areas that were searched at George Gordon. Now here's one of the other pieces that we're dealing with. If you look way in the bottom here, you see that little pink spot location B, and you're thinking, what the heck, where is that? That's not even close to the school. Well, that's where the first school stood. So now we have a couple sites. And when I said, you know, our cemetery in Regina is 6.4 kilometers, look at the, the kilometer here dealing with George Gordon. And I have to tell you to take a look at those big black spots there. Those are bodies of water. And these are sloughs that we haven't even begun to do the process of searching what those sloughs are, what they have within those sloughs. So in working with a lot of our um, groups and, and talking with groups right across Canada that are doing this work, some very, very important pieces are water, any bodies of water. Usually um, there's, 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 there's kind of a reoccurring theme around two to three kilometers around where the original building was is another area that's really of interest and then gardens if there were gardens close by so when you think about you know um, having to dispose of something very very quickly um, if you had to if you were getting a visit from a government official or you needed to um, um, you know something can happen you want to do that very very quickly and something very very close so that's kind of a kind of a reoccurring theme here. When we did, we picked four locations uh, with George Gordon and Area A. There, there were 14 um, anomalies that were hit. Um, area A, I'm trying to see here, trying to squint, is the uh, playground. And I have to tell you, this is one of the most. We had to wait until the school was out before we could search that playground, because the search was right beside the primary end of that school that exists there in George Gordon right now. And it's really hard to explain to the kids why we're searching their playground for bodies and remains. So that's where location A is right beside the school. 
Location B is a fruit cellar that took place um, on, on George Gordon's. There was a, uh, a great big uh, cellar where, where food was stored, and uh, that was the that was the second site. Uh, C was the garden area, and of course D was the area there uh, where the old school was. So the numbers beside A, B, C, D are the actual number of anomalies that we found. Now, out of all those anomalies, we had 14 um, possible uh, burials that showed up in the garden area um, right by the, by the school. Here's uh, some of the results from the Wellness Centre. Um, if you're familiar with George Gordon's, the Wellness Centre is just outside the current gym. Uh, it's the west side of the gym. And again, you can see the top uh, area that looks like uh, a bunch of uh, a blueprint there that we're not quite sure uh, to the naked eye what it means. But those people that are trained expertise in this area can understand. Underneath are, are three different types of, of anomalies. So if you take a look at, uh, you know, the, the, the bumps right here, I'm going to see if I can just take this off and go fiddle up here because I can touch my, I don't have a pointer with me. Maybe I can't, Morris. Okay, maybe I can't take this off, can I? Oh, my ITs are gone. Okay, so this, if you take a look at the, the top, the top row here, and you count the, the third going this way, that, that's a root, it's the ore metal. You can see how it's shaped and, and the, 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 the little waves are going up there. And then if you take a look um, at the second row, the one at the end again, you can see the irregular, irregular terity, how irregular, try that again, those marks are. If you take a look at the two on the top row here, the first two, you can see their similarities. So when they're looking at some of this, they're looking at the depth, the size, and the shape, and the reoccurring patterns of what this looks like. And that's how they determine and distinguish the difference between a root, a metal, and a possible burial. So the burials will predominantly be the same shape, same depth. And that's what they're looking for, the similarities. So these are uh, some of the um, findings with uh, George Gordon, First Nation. 2014, uh, the Regina Indian Industrial School uh, did, did another, another survey. Um, and this time, um, this one was done a little bit to the north. Um, so the purple, purple line here is the original fence that you can see. And then the survey now was going to be three different areas, which included a piece towards the north of the fence. Also in the east area, that's supposed to be area, and the south side of the fence underneath in the green. So you could see the areas that were that were searched uh, in that, that second search in 2014 that was done. These results in 2014, um, included uh, six additional possible burials that were identified on the south side of the fence. Um, at this point, uh, no data was recorded on the west side of that fence. Um, it says gas lines, but we learned that it's not gas lines that are at the top there. Um, it's actually water line. And you can see how close that, that water line and the digging there are kind of came very, very close to the cemetery. Uh, one of the pieces that we're really working on um, with currently with the work that's taking place right now is building a framework for different companies, crown corporations, and different engineer teams that are coming out and they're working close within the vicinity of the cemeteries. There needs to be some certain protocol guidelines and cautionary measures that are put in place before any work takes place close to these cemeteries. So we're in the process of, of, of sharing, hopefully uh, within the next few months, uh, a framework uh, that we've been working on uh, with the city of Regina to protect these areas a little bit more. And I can tell you, um, you know, most of our areas that we're working with have been disturbed. Um, there's been building that's been happening around. And I can also tell you that the construction crews coming out are not trained to look for bone fragments. They're not trained to identify any of these pieces. So if anything turned up, there's great, um, speculation that it would have went unnoticed by a lot of the teams that were doing the building and the digging around um, at the time when they were not when we were not doing searching yet. So it's absolutely critical for these places to remain untouched until our work is done 
and know that's really, really, really hard that we're dealing with right now, uh, trying to figure out what's happening with parking lots. We're dealing with railroad tracks. We're dealing with cement plants. I'm dealing with cement plant um, to see if there's anything underground uh, that may have went undetected um, back in the day. So uh, with the survey results 2014, um, the line, the, the, the uh, gas line um, was very close to the sewer line, sorry, excuse me, it's a sewer line. And then uh, there were a 50 meter buffer on the south side of the fence there um, where the other uh, burials were identified at that time. So uh, part of this important work um, is the whole work around the heritage status. And again, I mentioned that we have allies and certainly one of our allies are the people that do the work at the Heritage Branch for us. Um, because we're dealing with uh, private property, um, there's a whole bunch of different issues and legalities in place. Now, when I talk about heritage status, I'm talking about our local heritage status. I'm also talking about heritage um, in Saskatchewan. Now, remember, I said this includes other provinces as well. Well, every province has a different act. They're not identical. And that's one of, the, one of the pieces that the government makes sure that all of our, our, our uh, provinces um, have different regulations to this. So they're not all identical, which makes our work very, very um, uh, heavy because then you have to navigate through these different acts when we get to the point of doing uh, deeper work. Um, so the heritage status provides legal protection. So at the time uh, when the searching was happening, uh, this property was still owned by a private landowner. Um, so with heritage status attached to this particular piece of land, we were able to access the land and do the necessary work. It still was owned by the private landowner uh, who still had full legal status over the land, um, but they were, it prevented any future alterations. So really nothing could be done with the land um, in terms of any building or any digging or any of those pieces. So it became a part of the Municipal Heritage Properties Act, which has a whole bunch of uh, different regulations. But one of the important ones is, is there has to be written approval for any kind of alterations to that, that particular land before um, any work can be done. So that kind of saved us um, a whole lot of uh, uh, headaches, but also there's a whole bunch of different um, uh, regulations now that we have to go through if we want to make anything, putting in the markers, for example, um, in the cemetery that were donated to us from Pasco First Nation for medals, we had to ensure that the heritage folks knew that we were putting in these metal markers. Um, we also get a little bit of uh, financial assistance from them as well, um, but uh, we do um, get uh, different supports from different folks throughout. The Heritage Branch provides a whole bunch of expertise for us as well. So if we needed their technical support, we'd be able to work alongside them. There's also some property uh, search directories in there as well. Um, in 2016, the folks who were taking a, a strong lead on this uh, moved into the provincial heritage status. Here's the uh, the plaque that was given to us, and I am trying to trying to find out who has our plaque. <laughs> We have not found a place to um, attach it to yet or put up our heritage plaque. Uh, but at some point, we'll have the infrastructure in place around the cemetery where we can actually display this plaque uh, that was revealed in 2016. Um, and this was um, uh, done with um, uh, the minister. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty important um, move for us as, as the, the team. Uh, big surprise, uh, kind of out of nowhere here for us was the um, phone call that came back in July 2019 um, and uh, we we have friends in high places I'm, I'm pleased to say we did get a call from uh, Minister Goodale's office and, and Minister Goodale um, you know has been an absolute strong ally in, in providing supports to us as we do this work and uh, his office called um, and, and talked to us about uh, a first ever a land swap I had no idea, again, what a land swap was or what this entailed or the legalities around what was taking place. We just kind of blindly, again, went along with what we were um, wanting to do here. Uh, so what, what happened, my limited understanding here, so this is going to be like just a little peek at what this means. Um, the, the land was owned by a private owner. Uh, RCMP have land um, in different areas that they own. So somehow they, they organized a transaction 
which entailed doing a change over giving the landowner a different piece of RCMP owned land and then swapping that out um, for this particular cemetery. So then the cemetery kind of switched for I think maybe a day or two and was a property of the RCMP. And then the RCMP then came to the commemorative association and did a legal exchange and transferred complete ownership of the cemetery over to the commemorative association. So it was huge and I do believe that we may be the only uh, uh, people in Canada that do that where this has happened. Uh, so the land swap was very, very significant um, to us, which means we have legal ownership over uh, the, the cemetery now. So there's a lot of work that that entails. There's a lot of, lot of legal obligations that we have as we do this work, but um, we were more than happy to accept uh, the transfer of tobacco there. And you can see, um, oh my gosh, I always forget her name. Who can help me? Brenda Lucky. Brenda Lucky, absolutely, thank you. Uh, Brenda Lucky is uh, uh, giving me tobacco there um, in, in one of the red, red uh, RCP uh, little bags that they made particularly specifically for this day. Um, we are beginning a new search. We have begun a new search. There has been a new search that has been done. And there is work that is happening on that side of Regina. And um, when I talk about the work that's happening on that side of Regina, there's a, a new expansion on the west side. So it's really kind of amplified the work that we have to do now because we're trying to really, really uh, work with these engineer teams, these crown corporations, um, all of these other groups to ensure that this land is really protected. Um, so we're making sure that if you're coming out here and you have to do some work, where are you working? Share with us your plans. Uh, where are you going to park your heavy machines? We don't want the ground to be disturbed in any way, shape or form because we know that we have to search that area. Um, working alongside with this particular search, I have to tell you, we have had uh, wonderful relations, lots of dialogue, lots of conversations, lots of learning on both sides on how to move forward doing this work and requesting um, uh, that these people have uh, due diligence. They have a duty to consult. And when you're working with us and you're working with RISE and you're working with uh, any work that's happening with the cemetery, you're also working with our leadership. You're working with our First Nation elected leadership from the 39 different First Nations communities that are attached to the cemetery. It's not about the Rise Commemorative Association, it's about the leadership who, who owns this work. It's their descendants, it's their members that are a part of the cemetery. So we make sure that there is due diligence when we're talking about government to government relations, I don't want a letter uh, sent to us from a project lead. If you're going to be talking to our elected leadership in any way, shape, or form in written communication, I want it from your leader to my leader. And that's how we're going to do this work. Because that's due diligence, that's duty to consult, and that's paying uh, respect to the significant historical background of this particular cemetery, but acknowledging the relationship between our leaders as well. Uh, so this particular area here in orange now is a 22, uh, 23 uh, GPR work. We have asked that this go over uh, the road. Uh, Pinky Road is 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 being um, has been searched, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that Tom is going to share a little more, more about uh, the, the search and this process. But I have to tell you, when we're talking about a search. This is not a big area again. This is not a big area at all, but it takes a lot of manpower. It takes a lot of uh, resources to be able to do these little areas. So if you take a look at all of the squares, um, that started happening in 2012. And that's how far along we are. So it's taken, it's taken time. All of this work takes a lot of time. And like I said, it takes a lot of people. Uh, who are dedicated to to doing this 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 really significant significant work? We have lots of challenges, lots and lots of challenges. Uh, this is not easy, and we know that there's an urgency for community members to learn and find some answers. We also know that we're losing our members and some of our our survivors at a very rapid pace, and we want to have some answers before they leave us. We're working really hard to do that. But some of the obstacles and the barrier or the issues that we have 
or the whole piece around private land ownership. And I know that my colleagues um, in, in many other areas have talked about, you know, wanting to or needing to search areas that belong to private owners, landowners, private property owners. Um, these are some of the issues that we're, we're trying to deal with. We also know that archival information, although it provides some information for us, we know it's flawed. We know that a lot of the, um, there, there's a lot of communication issues, there's language issues uh, that came along at this time. So the information is not 100% accurate. You can't solely rely on the archival information um, as much as we'd like to. We also have to deal with multiple levels of government. So we're not just dealing with one act, we're dealing with a couple of acts. And when people say to us, you know, when we start looking at, at you know, uh, really critical pieces like looking at, at human remains and trying to identify those, that is significant, significantly difficult, difficult work. And I, I, I'm not sure if, if that work will get done in my lifetime. I'm going to say probably not because we still have so much work that needs to be done when we're trying to, first of all, find all of the different burial possible deposit areas. Um, we haven't even got close to, to the identification work yet. So that's going to take a very long time. And we talk about this work as being intergenerational work. So I'm really pleased with young people uh, being in the room and being a part of this because this is something that you're going to inherit, just like you, you've inherited the fallout of the residential schools. This is going to be part of the work that you will inherit and will have to do. So this information is for you as well. So you know part of the history of where this work came from and how it started. A huge uh, conversation is around our archival pieces. Where do we store the archives, the information that we found? Um, we have it right now in our homes, um, in our home offices, um, in our garage. Uh, we have to find a place to store this information where it's safe. Uh, we don't want it to be um, taken in by museums because we know how difficult it is to get our pieces back again, our sacred pieces that tell a part of our story. Um, so we're still struggling with where, where do we store artifacts? What do we do with them when we find them? Where's a safe place where they won't get destroyed by fire, water, any of those natural elements or, or, or get taken um, by someone else? So we have to really put a lot of thought into that. We do have a an uh, opportunity to work with the uh, National Truth and Reconciliation piece and, and storing some of our work there. Uh, but the, then again, you know, it, it's stored, it's away. It's not ours, it's tucked away somewhere. So we're having lots of conversations on that. The other piece is cultural incongruence and competencies, working with a lot of, um, a lot of different uh, construction crews, uh, engineer teams, um, corporate folks. Uh, lots of those people don't understand the cultural component. There's a lot of people that come with very, very strong expertise and technical skills that know how to do this work, but they don't understand our spiritual laws. They don't understand that the work that we do here is spiritual work, and there are spiritual ways to do this work, and we have to abide by those spiritual laws because we know what they mean. We know those repercussions if we don't. And to try to articulate the importance of the spiritual component of this is so difficult, so difficult when you're working with other partners that don't understand the issues in our spiritual connection to these sacred, sacred sites. And this is absolutely sacred sites. And trying to explain that over and over every time we get a phone call, can we come out to the cemetery? Yes, you can, but here's some things that you need to do before that. So one of the things, here, here's a small example. Uh, we have Flower Day, um, and those of you that are your community told Flower Day, um, we started doing that with the Regina um, Indian uh, Cemetery. And uh, we take all the artifacts that were left there, um, the gifts, the toys, um, the different clothing artifacts that people will leave there for the children, we'll take them and we will dispose of them. And, and of course, we can't have a, a fire in, in, in Regina. <laughs> it goes against, uh, goes against the rules of the city, so we can't burn. Um, so we have to take them out. So we haul them out uh, to another to another community and we dispose of them that way because we know why we have to do those things as, as Indian people. Um, so that's just a small part of that, um, you know, following those spiritual ways and those spiritual 
um, laws that we've been taught to honor as we do this work. The other huge piece is media. Holy cow, you guys, I, I can't even tell you. Um, I, I've had uh, wonderful uh, conversations with the media, absolute respect with the media, but you will get one story that kind of gets misinterpreted that goes out into our community and it spreads like wildfire. Twitter's lighting up, Facebook's going, like it's just crazy. So when we do this work, we have to, those of us that are doing this work, our team, we get the news first and foremost. And I tell you, when we got the news of what we had to share with our community, we didn't sleep for weeks. There was a couple weeks we couldn't sleep because all you could think about was what you know. And you can't share that right away because you need to find a way to ensure that all your community members are going to be safe when they hear the results of what you're going to share. And that takes a little bit of time. You have to bring in the health professionals. There is not one of our communities that can withstand or has the supports and resources to deal with the mental health crisis. We just can't. We don't have the capacity or the resources to do that. We know that. So bringing this out takes a lot of conversation, a lot of planning. So that the search teams are holding this news right here and it is the heaviest, heaviest thing that you have to carry. And my eyes were burning <laughs> all the time because the tears were ready to fall. My throat was tight, couldn't sleep, stress, and lots of tears. And that's how we're trying to strategize and we're trying to figure out we can't, we can't share this publicly yet. We have to share with our community members. We have to share with the public. We have to find a way to do that. So we have to do it in a very, very thorough, try to be as detailed as possible and not let the story be told by someone else. And one of the things as Indigenous people is our stories that have always been taken from us and another narrative has been attached to that story. And it's so important that we keep these stories. These are our stories. This is our history. These are our descendants, our people. And we want to keep these stories. So working with the media is huge. You have to have a media strategy. If you don't, things are going to go like wildfire. And then once it's out there, it's really hard to pull back. So we really think about that very, very carefully. How are we going to commu communicate this to everybody? Knowing that I've got 39 different communities right across Canada. I've got some in the States. How am I going to let all the descendants know what we're doing? Again, you have to have a communication strategy. Have to find a way to communicate. And we also have we also have elections. So I try to communicate with the 39 leaders, send them emails saying, this is what's happening. Here's an important letter. Um, if you're ever asked by your community, please share it on your social media site, just so people know. So trying to inform our, communi our, our, our communities in it is, is very important. And making sure we're on top of the communication is huge. Moving forward, there's still a lot of work that we need to do in the area of education, uh, talking to our community members. And I, I feel, feel really um, education is, is an important part of my life and my world. And I know that the more that we share, uh, the better off we'll be sharing with our community members about what this work means. Just like people shared with me what GPR work means. Um, all of this stuff is really, really important to share. Um, how do we commemorate knowing that, you know, we have people from 39 different reserves um, from all of these treaty areas, um, from all different tribes. How, how do we begin to build one, one, one commemorative piece? We don't know. We don't know how to do that yet. How do we build a framework? There really isn't, hasn't been a framework here. Uh, those of us that have done this search just started, um, and, and we work with our heart. We don't work with guidelines. There's no book on how to do this. There's no blueprint. We just work. And no two communities are doing identical work. It doesn't look like that. And I just say to communities, when you're doing this work, just work with your heart and your prayers, and you'll get the work done. But it will look differently from each community to the next. Don't compare yourself what those guys are doing over there in Kamloops. They're doing sacred work as well. But our work is just as sacred, and the way that we do it depends on our community. So our communities provide direction on how this work looks and how this work unfolds. We're also working at um, correcting the past. So many of you have seen this picture of this young fellow. This is Thomas Markisic. 
Thomas Markisik was number 22 that attended the Regina Indian Industrial School. Thomas Moore came in August. And when I was going through the ledger and taking a peek through the ledger and looking at the names on there, I saw that in May, there were two other children that came, Samuel and Christine Kisick. And when I read at the end of the ledger, saw that their parents were, it was kind of more Kisick. And as I flipped through and it came down to August and fall is when I saw Thomas's name. And the first thing that came to mind was Hannah Moore hid her baby. And they came around a second time and they found Thomas. And I tell you, the tears wouldn't stop flowing. And I know I, I don't mean to be disrespectful to our men in the room, our protectors. But for the females here, that maternal bond and that maternal bond that we have, and once that's broken, your spirit is broken. It's devastating. And I think about Hannah Moore, and I think about her losing all of her children and the detriment that had on her spirit and the spirit of other mothers. In the room. Part of what I'm working on is trying to find descendants to this young fellow. We've had a few leads, but they kind of didn't, they didn't, they didn't pan out. So we're still looking. We might have to turn to our media friends to give us some help with that. The other big piece is how do we get this land back? All of this land that houses and holds the remains of our ancestors and our descendants, how do we get that back? What are the legalities that are involved with that? So we still have amounts of work to do in that area. I wanna thank you so much for listening to me. Um, here's a couple of the significant folks that, that work with me as well. So I do have David and, and Allison who are kind of my right and left hand. Uh, that work a lot with me, but we have a large membership of devoted community members that are a consistent part of the work that we do, um, a consistent part of the volunteers that we work with. Um, we do put volunteer calls out there every now and then, and we get a really, really quick response, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And this past year, we did get a donation, um, an application that we put in for some funding. We were able to go to the website, so we do have our website uh, down there. And it's more for people who have questions about the work that we do, who we are as a commemorative association, and more importantly, the history of who we deal with um, in the cemetery. So please do go to the site, uh, Dr. Uh, Doug Stewart's book that he wrote based on the archival information is on our site in the e-copy for any uh, survivors that want to see what that's about. Um, again, thank you so much. I'm, I'm completely honored uh, to share our journey with you today and um, thank you for, for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for that presentation. And um, just sitting, listening to Sarah, just at the very end there, uh, really, really touched my heart. Um, that photo that we've seen over and over of uh, Thomas, um, it just reminded me about how grateful I am to be where we are today. Um, my son is going to be 11 next month, and uh, we've never cut his hair. And he's got this beautiful, beautiful long braid, and he just loves it. He just absolutely loves it. And it's become such a part of his identity. He's named it Bob. <laughs> Just recently, he's like, this is my my braid. His name is Bob. And he does little pictures and stuff like that. And even when he was a little boy, you know, little stick figures, he'd draw the little circle and eyes. And there'd always be a little stick sticking out from the back of the round head. That was his braid ever since he was a little kid. So, you know, as mothers, um, I, I'm just so grateful when he turned six. You know, I it wasn't lost on me. The history of our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents having our children taken and um, in many cases never coming home. And so um, I've, I've long held him tight and I'm so grateful. And uh, I always think about our families in that way. So thank you, Sarah, so much for sharing all of that. 
We may have some time for questions. We're going to be getting our next presenter um, online. who will be joining us through Zoom. Um, but is Kurt ready? And wait, we might have to do a few. Okay, we're gonna take a few seconds. So we do actually have some time then for some questions. If anyone has questions uh, from the presentation we just heard, we can take a few minutes to do that. Okay, so if there's no questions, that is fine. We will just wait, make sure we've got Kurt coming up here. Right. And as we're waiting for that, I'll just take a few moments to, to remind everybody of uh, what we have in place here. We're going to have lunch at noon and we do still have some light snacks um, that we can grab in the multi-purpose room. And just as we're going through the presentations this morning, I know that I've had some emotional responses. Um, and so we do have some sheets of paper just outside um, the area here that has phone numbers um, that um, you can take home with you if you want extra support or additional support. And as Chief Starr had indicated earlier, it's so important as we discuss these issues that we make sure that we nourish and look after ourselves um, and make sure that we just take care of our tender hearts. You know, like this is such um, emotional work. Um, and as Sarah had alluded to, deeply spiritual work. And we have many ways to, to support one another. So uh, just want to remind you that we have additional resources on top of what we already provide. And how are we coming along with Kurt? Okay. Okay. So yeah, we're just waiting for our next presenter. I like that we're doing more, um, well, I mean, we always have our challenges with the technology, but it's good that we can join in this way and, and make sure we have presentations for people who can't physically be here. So we'll just get that set up. Um, in the meantime, if you do need to grab a cup of coffee or a muffin or take a quick little break, uh, maybe we'll just take our time to get the technical part set up and we can resume in five to 10 minutes. So I'll just give a little warning. So if you need a little fresh air break or a little stretch, I don't know how many of you have done journey dance with me. I do a movement. I could, I could get us doing a <laughs> stretch breaks to move the body. But if you don't, you might want to scurry out to get the juice and get some fresh air. So let's see, I'll look at the time. Okay, it's 10.45, so we'll plan to resume at 10.50, so five minutes. Okay. I don't even know if Sarah might have, I don't, I was just giving notes. I don't know.
So here, can you get on? I'm going to turn my phone over to Boris. You're talking. We just got a microphone over to me and Boris. Okay, so Kirk, just, just introduce yourself where you're from there. I can see you on the screen. So we're going to turn the screen.
Lord. Okay, is this all set to go? Okay. Oh, hold on. Do we still have all right. Can you hear me with can you hear me through this mic? Probably not. How's that? Okay. All right, so we're gonna figure this out, but we are going to get started. So we do have our next presenter. So welcome back from the break. Hope you had a chance to stretch your legs, get a breath of fresh air, refill your coffees, and uh, we'll, we'll do this uh, next presentation up until noon. All right, so I'm gonna just get ahead and introduce Kurt Young. Can you ask Kurt to mute himself? Ask him to mute himself till we're ready. Can you mute him? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, well, I think that probably woke everybody up. I know it did for me too. So we were feeling kind of had mid-morning low energy. Uh, that, that's got me perked up. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Kurt Young. I think we've got that audio figured out. Um, so our next presenter um, is presenting on behalf of George Gordon, IRS. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from him. Kurt Young is an international entertainer, singer, songwriter, brass dancer, artist, actor, and videographer. His roots are in Saskatchewan, where he is a registered member of George Gordon First Nation. Both of his parents attended residential school. His father, George, had attended Maribel, and his mother attended Muskaugan residential schools. He is the youngest of four children and is the first generation to have not attended residential school. His healing has been through art in all of its forms. Kurt's music embraces storytelling, <coughs> storytelling as a solo artist, and high energy performances as Kurt Young and the Healers, using music as a teaching tool to unite people. So maybe we'll just, anyway, Kurt Young, um, he has a video, they found us, it's a way of honoring this background family and community, and with that, we're gonna go to Kurt. Welcome Kurt, I think we'll just turn the sound over to you now. All right. Well, hello, everybody. It's T I'm, I'm uh, coming to you here from. Uh, am I on mute? From from old Kinsis, uh, there's a little bit of a time lag here. I can hear in the audio and see in the uh, also in the here in the uh, audio and see in the video, but that's okay. We'll go through this. Uh, and so I just want to uh, start off here by uh, starting off with an honor song. I'm originally from George Gordon's First Nation. And, um, you know, I, I, my original plan before I started this uh, project was to film elders. And because of COVID, um, that whole thing was, was put on pause. And so the next thing is, I talked to my cousin Sarah, and she said that they were going to be planning the, the meetings for the, uh, for the search for the unmarked graves. So I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to record this and uh, just record all the proceedings that led up to it. And it kind of developed into this um, documentary called They Found Us. And so, you know, it was, uh, it, was a, it was quite a journey because I ended up learning so much about my community. Uh, you know, I grew up in Alberta most of my life. So, you know, getting a chance to go home and, um, you know, learn some of these things was, was super important to me. But um, it's always important for me, as I said, I'm here in uh, Mokinsis, which is Calgary. That's the Blackfoot word for the elbow. Um, it's always important for me to play an honor song uh, from where I'm at and also for all of you here today that we share information and we learn uh, from each other here today. 
for all the abundance that Mother Earth gives to us each and every day. Um, you know, this last two years has been a, uh, a good example that, you know, Mother Earth this will never belong to human beings. Um, that we, we always belong to Mother Earth. And if we become uh, a disease, you know, here on this Earth, Mother Earth will find a way to fight it back. And I think this last two years has been an, an example of that. That's why it's important for us to honor the earth and, and start off with, with these honor songs. So I thank you to all the uh, elders out there uh, for the prayers that were said today. Uh, this song is for, um, you know, I, I was talking to an elder and, and she said, please don't call me a survivor. She said, please call me a, a thriver. And I really like that. So this is for all the thrivers um, out there and also um, for all the, the children uh, still uh, yet to be set free and found um, and for all the family members that are going uh, through this. This is for all of you. Hi, hi. people 
have passed away. One including is my father. Uh, he passed away six months after the film was was completed, and also Benny Kratz as well. So, you know, as I said, I think it's important that we get our elders' stories, um, you know, because every day they are passing away, going to that next level. And I think it's really, even if you just have an iPhone, if you're listening to me out there right now, and you have a cookbook and a mushroom, you have any sort of phone, please get their story. Please record their stories of, you know, good stories too, not just their experience in the residential school, but the history of the land. I think it's so important. We had somebody on board this First Nation that was 100 years old that passed away this year. And I really hope that, uh, you know, somebody has their story. And it was uh, part of my uh, uh, my my, uh, my brother's uh, family, his in-laws. So, you know, I just, uh, you know, it's really important to get those stories, I believe, on, on video. And that's what this whole process was. It wasn't to, uh, you know, make the documentary to, to win awards or become famous or any of those things. It was just really uh to to get the stories and and hopefully people way down the line will will be able to look back and get some of the information from people that really went to the schools because that's what this documentary was was focused on too is some of the people that had actually attended and then people that are are doing the the uh you know the ongoing work like, like sarah and the committee so um you know with with that I will uh, let the film play once again. I, I thank you for having me here, and um, you know it's. I think it's important for all of us, and, and especially in this digital world here, um, to remember to take advantage in the best way by using you know the technology to record you know our elders. And one little thing I'll leave you with before um, before I let you go here is you know an elder. I was sitting in a session, a, a live session, and I was expecting a very important phone call, and my phone buzzed in my pocket. And so I pulled out my phone, and I looked at my phone, and I looked up at the elder, and the elder was looking at me directly in the eyes, and I said, oh, man, I'm in trouble now. So after the uh, the session, he goes like this to me, like, come on, I want to talk to you. And I said, jeez. So I went over there. And he said, no, I just, uh, I want to tell you a story like this. Something I tell my children or my, my grandchildren is that, uh, you know, technology is the future. He said, I compare it to when my grandfather's grandfather uh, first got metal, you know, um, when we first got knives. Because, like, our, our rocks were sharp, our tools were sharp but they could chip and it was really hard to resharpen them. When the metal came over, you could resharpen it. It was really hard to chip. He said, but if you didn't know what you're doing with that metal, you could cut yourself. You could cut your finger off. You could hurt yourself. He said, I compare technology to that. He said, you know, when your elders are speaking to you, when your kukum is speaking to you, when your mushroom is speaking to you, take out your headphones, put that phone away. You know, unless you're recording their, their stories, um, you know, because maybe when you're done with updating your statuses, maybe when you're done with checking your emails and, and getting along with your work, you'll finally look up and your elder might not be there. Uh, so always take take that time, um, you know, when your elders are speaking to you, to you uh, you know, make sure when you're having dinner, like get your kids to take their headphones out. I know that's an everyday struggle, but just always keep that uh, human contact is is uh, the lesson that I took. But you know, technology is the future, so we can use it to get our stories down. We can use it to get stories from our elders and, and record what's happening right now in, in today's time. Because I think this is huge. You know, this is a. Uh, I think every story should be reported uh, along these searches. You know, this is a, a, a another um, secret that's uh, that's un unveiled here. You know, uh, a part of Canada's history that uh, Canada has to own and has to face up to. And 
So anyways, uh, thank you so much, everybody. Have a beautiful day. Thank you for having me. Um, I will do, um, Sarah and I are talking about doing another extended version on off top of this. So this isn't done. It's, it's going to be uh, continued, the search, and uh, I will upgrade the video as it goes as well. So thank you so much and have a great day. Hi, hi. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I, I thought that uh, you guys were going to be sharing the link here. Um, I'm not sure how to actually share um, the video on, on uh, you know, Zoom. Um, so, yeah, I, I did send the link over to, uh, to Sarah. Sure. Okay, I sent it over, I sent it by link to uh, Sarah's phone.
Do you want me to share it to your uh, email? Share it also in the link here in the chat as well. Let's see here. I'm just grabbing it now. Let's see here. Sure. Yeah. I sent it in there. It should be in the chat now. Some huge part of it is, is piecing together 
uh, missing pieces of, of information, missing pieces of our history, so that we get a full picture of where we came from. Um, not only does it shape uh, the history for us as, as First Nations people, but also for you know, Canada. Every Canadian needs to learn this history to understand uh, where we came from as a country and how we got to this point uh, today where we're you know, doing a number of searches right across the country of Canada. I think there's a lot of people that still don't understand why we're doing this work and why it needs to be done. But growing up, you know, there was not a lot of that history that was really shared. Um, we didn't know um, that there were, you know, unmarked graves where kids were, uh, you know, buried in uh, different places. We knew, you know, we heard stories of kids running away from residential schools, you know, from my siblings and, and my cousins that went to the school. So we knew there were, you know, runaways. We knew that kids, uh, you know, went to bed one night and woke up the next morning and beds were empty. So we knew those things were happening, but I don't think at the time, you know, really crossed uh, a lot of our minds, those of us that didn't go to the school, that, you know, the, these kids were, were, were being buried. I think I understood the truth. The shame and the guilt that comes with all that abuse I went through. Did you ever learn all about the truth? Two people that did white men and white women. You said that's what abused me as a child. A lot of people don't like being to talk about it today. I can talk about it today. And then some of the spots on the reserve here, I know exactly where that old residential school was. And there's another school way up in the south there. In one year. And they're talking about this lake here. That lake was never had four years ago. And I'm very proud of you two young guys for exactly what you do. When I walked in here, I've seen this kid here sitting here, and the girl up uh, sitting back there. I haven't seen him for over 30 years. That's my relative, and I haven't seen him in years. So I just stay away from him. I don't know what he was. No way coming to this preserve. Yet I belong here. So I keep my distance. We, we, he counsels me on the phone, or we meet, we go for a coffee somewhere. And then I'm going to get that brother to Same with him. And I'm very proud of my heart to see that there are two native, native people doing this. Because when I look at it, and I see a white man doing it, I'm going to write something down. I did, I did an interview way back at the old band office with a reporter from D.C. And I went, I went to uh, Moshe for a doctor's appointment. And I don't read the Hebrew Reader's Digest book. And my story was in there. So I got my partner to read it. And all I wanted to do was kill that man because he changed every word. And made it sound so jolly and green what I went through. I don't really get to school. And I don't hold them. Don't ever come out here because I'm going to hurt you. You know, sometimes I sit beside this man and think, let's go. Come on out here and meet me to talk about something. I had so much anger, so much shame. But today, you don't bother me. I can talk about it. I have to learn how to forgive these people. Children, I have five grandchildren, I believe. Um, yeah, I'm a 
was a former chief of a George Gordon First Nation and the band counselor. It was uh, four years. I was in for four years both times for chief and for council. On Gordon First Nation, there was um, not too much to do when I was growing up. Um, you had to have uh, a lot of money to be involved in any kind of sports. I grew up mostly, uh, of course, living with my grandmother, did a lot of hunting, and um, yes, I attended the uh, Gordon Residential School for um, probably about four years. When I was in school, I had uh, noticed that uh, my first day in, I had heard um, some kids talking in the middle of the night, and I got up and went and looked, and I seen a couple of boys kissing. There were three boys sitting together, and I knew that there was something very wrong from there. It was very strict. Uh, kids were constantly beaten for the most minor things. Um, probably every day in school, we had to line up. We had to uh, say a prayer before lunch, and then almost every day somebody was punched or kicked by the uh, supervisors. I seen a lot of kids uh, fighting. I seen a lot of kids um, supervisors making kids uh, pile on on a kid that they didn't like because uh, they didn't want to directly beat them, but they made these uh, other kids basically beat them. And, uh, for sure, there was uh, violence. Violence was the normal thing. Overreacting to every situation was the normal thing. Um, it was just, uh, your mind was focused on, on staying alive, basically. I had learned to, I found really learned to read a room and look at who was there and what was the potential for violence happening from each and every person. And planning out in my mind what I was going to do is if you shoot something go down, basically. So I think I found that uh, my mind was uh, just focused on violence and surviving and fighting and what I was needing to do in order to you know, get out of the situation. Well, my mother being at the uh, um, scout in residential school, they called it a mission. That's where you heard stories about uh, things like that going on. Um, for Gordons, I hadn't heard so much, but of course, uh, nobody really talked about the school and nobody really talked about the, the things that did go on at the school. But, you know, um, I wouldn't doubt, you know, that that's a possibility, especially when even amongst the staff, it was uh, hush hush about everything. Everybody just wanted to keep their jobs. We were working at the school, <clears throat> so they kind of stuck together as a team, and nobody really spoke about, uh, you know, about anything. It was just follow the rules, and everybody kept their mouth shut too. Even with me living with my grandmother, I understood that, like years later, it was the result of my mother being in a residential school. I think um, <clears throat> for the reserves to um, to flourish and to grow, they need um, they need um, a future they need they need education like promised under the trees basically the trees need to be implemented so we need education we need employment and we need trading i think we need our own first nation businesses i think the first nation needs to take a look at the land and um create businesses that are going to um, i guess flow with the land and with the people if you don't if you don't if you don't if you don't you put up on it in your surrounding and your uh, your place will take place to come home. You might learn to run. But I'm uh, wrestling and fighting myself in that way. I learned how to be a man. Oh you say this.
poisoning our town. We think it's going to be under this. It is for the one great mouthful of spite. We carry down the name to our singing group. We travel all over the world, seeing different cultures, getting a little a lot of friends. Make other friends by doing this. Wasn't for this pipe, you know, we would have lost all our ceremonies. My grandfather, Rock, with a grandmother tree, that's a connection, grandfather and our grandmother. For me, this year, the small boys whispered, they found us. That the world that struck me, the 250 children, they had been able to live in school in BC. That number was scared. Not that the number is small, but more and more. Discovered her being gay, the community of the country in the hurt, the drama, and the devastation of her defense is full. I thought they had better go to the contact of the Sierra Lone and begin the process of searching out of that for possible unmarked graves. One of the public plans here are any in their committee for the work they have been doing in preparation for the physical service of the land. We need to understand that this process, whether or not we are found, we might have been to our spendings. We want to have this support in place for these individuals. Who are we? The first ones of the land. What does indigenous really mean? I woke up in my 40s realizing I had no idea where I come from. Anything about the traditional teachings that are of the land that I belong to, George Gordon's First Nation. My given name is Kurt Longman. But after my father and mother married, I became Kurt Young. I am in the process of changing my name to Kurt Great Buffalo. Every time I start any performance, workshop, or any other engagement, I always pay respects to our elders. Without their survival, none of us would be here. My name is George Young. I was born in the Council's First Nation Reserve in Saskatchewan. Well, um, for the first six years, I thought I lived on a farm, really. You know, one of the little guys with an oversized slingshot in my back pocket and, and actually a loving life until the day came when the two big gentlemen came to our homes and threatened my mom that I was supposed to go to the federal government Indian residential boarding school. And it was not a request, it was an order. So I think my mom so I went there. I'm a mean, long man, young, and I'm from George Gordon First Nation. Okay. Born and raised, born right on the way here, by big legs. What? Yeah, my sister Anna was one of my big legs. You were born on the reserve? Yes. Right in uh, where? Carabot's in Carabot's house. Here in Russia. Wow. Yeah. And delivered by my oldest sister. <laughs> and she was a midwife. She was a midwife. Wow. That's a crazy. <laughs> wow. That's really amazing to think that um, in that short of time. And why do you think that happened? Why do you think that was? That well, there's, no lot, really. there's no way to. I mean, when we have to leave the reserve, we have to get the okay by the end of the age. And it was never available when people went into labor, right? There was only one hostel that we left stock, and half the time there was no transportation. So wow. they just had their babies on the right at home. That's amazing to think that that's, you know, something that happened in the last 40 years. There was no electricity. You know, I was too young to know, but it was a rough childhood for sure. Yeah. I'm saying, gee, you know, it's a little guy with the old pants. With the little yellow strip. See, so, gee, my grandma can do a better job patching. <laughs> That's whoever did your parent. I didn't realize he was local law enforcement, RTMP. So they forced my mom, they said, you will go to prison 
if you don't put George in these schools. That was the weirdest thing. Is my stepfather, see, my, my father was really excellent. Going back a bit, my father had joined the army, and I don't remember. So I was been very young. So things got worse. He came out, and he wasn't the same man. Didn't work. So my mom now is, I've got a stepfather. And instead of taking a helping us go down there, he hitched up his order and they were wild horses. They were just my mom and I holding these wicked horses in a little buggy. So I didn't know, and I, till later on, I started getting into working for a living, then I realized, holy cow, I don't know my heritage, I don't know my culture, my traditions. Oh, sir, how did you physically actually end up there? And was the Indian agent native or white? He said he was white. <laughs> so the Indian agents were white and the priest was, was obviously white as well. Um, and so they came to the house and were, did they give you guys notice or did they just show up one day? I don't remember. I just know that um, with all of us went to residential school. All of them were the drum. In the early morning, late at night, the last day he was staying and like, basically drunk and sleep and then wake up and get the first thing he heard. And of course he sang a lot in the, you know, one of the professional hall of singers. And uh, I remember my first time home from residential school and Rochelle was singing. He started to use his hand on his thing. And I got on my knees and I started praying because I said, well, my dad doesn't know what he's doing, he's going to go right now. Yeah, that's an interesting person. 
I guess for me it's it's it's, uh, it's sad and uh, disappointing that we we always hoped that we wouldn't find anything. An, an apology doesn't mean much to me. I think Canada has to uh, has to understand that, that they need to work with us to fix this. And I think, uh, you know, uh, an apology doesn't get us any, doesn't help us, doesn't help our community. And I only can speak for my community. And an apology doesn't help. It needs to be recognized by us. And they need to come to the First Nations that have a residential school on their hands and ask what they can do and how they can help us. I think that's the only way in that effort. adjustments to be expected to live in a cold empty box that never moved had no running water or power to begin with no animals to track if you did farm you could not sell anything unless it was approved by the indian agents or rcmp it was against the law to hold any ceremonies powwow dance to sing powwow at any gatherings well dance or any sort of traditional practice that would connect us to our elders or the ones before them. When the children were forced into the schools, they were told the teachings and the language on the land the priests and nuns stood on were evil. We needed to be saved. But yet our elders, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, still had a great sense of humor, laughing and busting out jokes even at the hardest of times. Laughter has always been a part of our healing. We are on our way to rebuilding who we once were as a proud people. Will we ever be the same? No, but we would not be growing if we did not move forward and have change. I have faith in our youth to bring our people to a whole new level of being and understanding. The elders say our youth will be our biggest teachers, growing, learning, healing. The next generation will be born proud and learning who they are from the very beginning, attending healing circles, whether it be beating, drum, talking stick, is the first step in defining who we are and where we truly come from.
I still get a knot in my stomach and my heart still pounds every time I view that video because it's a video of my home, it's a video about my family, it's a video about a sacred journey, it's a video about work that we still continue and need to do. On your tables, there's a number. If there are folks among us that need to call any of the toll-free numbers, please feel free to do that. I know it's not easy for us to watch and to hear the voices and to see our journeys. I think it's important for us though. I think it's important for us to see the journeys, to hear about our journeys, to share our collective grief with each other. I think that's important. And I think that's something that as Indigenous people, First Nations people, Indians, we do really well with each other. We share our grief. We have two council counselors here. If you need to share your grief, we have them sitting in the back here. Can you please put your hands up, ladies? If you need to talk to someone, they're both here. We also have uh, a smudge going around here uh, to smudge as well. There's a little bit of a technology lag in that video. Um, so I hope you were able to kind of keep up with the work. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that was the first phase. And we will be moving into the second phase. We're going to re-examine and expand some of those areas that we started searching. Before we begin our second phase with George Gordon First Nation, there's a lot of hand work that we have to do. So we have to clear the land. And you've seen some of, this, the, some of the bush out there that's really thick. Some of the trees are really, really big trees. They have to be removed by hand. They can't be removed with any kind of machinery because they're gonna cause damage to the, to the dirt. So imagine you saw the footage, you saw the trees, you saw all of the bush that leads to those sloughs. That has to be cleared out by hand in order for that GPR machine to do the work that it needs to do. So that's gonna take a lot of time to do that work. So I guess part of today was, you know, speaking to you that are here so that you could take the messages back to your family, let them know that this is very important work that we're working on, but we need time. We need time. We need understanding. We need patience. We can't rush this work. It's very, very important. I need to clarify one thing. And uh, on the video, um, and this is a very clear distinction that we need to make on the video. Um, in the beginning, Kurt said that it's one of the last residential schools to close in 1996. We have to clarify that it's the, the last residential school that was government run that closed in 1996. And my colleagues that'll share the afternoon with you will share uh, their dates. Um, but ours was still run by the government up to 1996. So just wanted to leave you with that clarification. Uh, thank you so much for listening to Kurt's video. I'll see if we could post it somewhere so you can watch it again um, on your own if you feel up to it. Um, I'm sure he's willing to come out and share the video with your communities as well. If you'd like him to come and share that video and hopefully you won't deal with the lagging technologies we did. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for, for sharing that, and thank you, everyone, for your, your patience and understanding and compassion as we dealt with the technical issue. Um, they do arise from time to time, and I just thank everyone for being so patient with that. I know it was a little difficult at the beginning, um, but as you can see, the video uh, was so profound and shared so much information. It was really important. We did what we could in the moment to make sure that that was shared and, and just went ahead despite the lag, and uh, glad that Kurt could join us uh, to share his perspectives and bring his message here as well. So just want to thank Kurt Young for his presentation, uh, for this video, and for the staff that helped um, solve some of the technical problems and moving forward as best we can, which is what we do, right? Every time we run into challenges, we all just do the very best we can every day. 
and uh, and that's what we did here. So we're just getting into our lunch hour. Um, so we will have a full hour. Uh, the food has arrived. It is in the multi-purpose room, and we will resume at once. So there is time to stretch, to move, um, to share. And again, we do have staff support here as well if you require that. Um, and just before we get started, I would like to request and ask uh, Cecile Asham if she could please pray for our food um, so we can enjoy a really good meal this afternoon. Wonderful. Thank you, Cecile. Appreciate that. So with that, we're going to take a break for lunch. Um, one thing, if, if you're open, it is um, over the lunch break, uh, I would invite you, if you to take some deep breaths, to stretch and move your body. There was a lot of information that was shared this morning and in part of some of the work that I do, um, I do a lot of healing work through the body, through movement. So uh, if you're so inclined, just take a good stretch, a few deep breaths, let some of that energy out and, um, and then we can come back for this afternoon and um, we'll, we'll hear more presentations. So we'll see you over lunch. Thank you. Oh, and then just, of course, one thing I would invite um, our elders, um, if you want to go first to go um, for food, or if there's somebody here that needs a plate of food brought to them, um, that we can just look after our elders here um, as we, we gather lunch. So and that's in the multi-purpose room. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hi, everyone. So we're going to get started in about five minutes or so. We'll get started great right at one o'clock. So five minutes to take care of anything else, and then we'll get started with the afternoon's presentations. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, good afternoon and welcome back. I just want to say a thank you to um, the cooks and to all those who prepared lunch. Thank you for the soup, for the sandwiches, for all of the snacks and uh, for feeding us really well. And I hope everybody uh, managed to get seconds or thirds or food to take home because there was quite a bit there left over. Okay, so we're going to get started with the rest of our afternoon. We've got two more presentations here, um, and we're just going to get right into it because there's a lot of information to cover. So hope you had a good chance to stretch, to move, eat some snacks, visit, and just uh, feel really good about your time here. So uh, our afternoon um, sessions for learning our way, sharing our knowledge and experiences on conducting searches for unmarked graves will continue. Uh, we're going to hear from Tam Nguyen, a senior archaeologist, as well as the Stark Lake Cree Nation search team and Sheldon Putra after, um, for the rest of the afternoon. So I'm looking forward to introducing Tam Nguyen. He is a senior archaeologist that has directed, supervised, and supported archaeological projects across the Prairie Provinces. Tam has extensive experience in various industry sectors, from heritage and, resort, sorry, from heritage and historic resource impact, to assessment mitigation studies for small-scale rural and urban infrastructure. Currently, Tam is the Vice President of the Saskatchewan Association of Professional Archaeologists. Tam is committed to growing and diversifying his skill set through working alongside professional and not-for-profit organizations. His work involves current projects with the Regina Indian Industrial School Cemetery with Stone and Arrow Consulting. And with that, I'd like to welcome Tam Nguyen up for his presentation. On the side, huh? We turned it. I uh, just turn on the PowerPoint. Oh, you got to put your present here. You're supposed to be in here. One moment, please. Thank you. 
Do you have video screen? Put it in here. Oh, I, I, I forwarded to Sarah. I thought oh, it's gonna oh, be oh. I don't have it. Oh, I gotta get the USB. I thought you had the USB. No, I didn't have the USB. Oh. Do you mind if my voice recorded? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sure. just gonna leave it here. Yeah. So while we're, while we're working out the um, IT issues, I suppose I can start the presentation. So, um, I'd like to first start off by extending my, my gratitude for the invitation to not only be on Treaty 4 territory, but to contribute whatever it is you feel that I can contribute to this conversation. Um, I myself was born and raised on Treaty 6 territory where I currently reside with my wife, Denise, my son. Sorry about that, I don't know. Yeah, okay. So I currently reside on 36 territory where I live with my wife, Denise, my son, Arayu, and my daughter, Clementine. Um, ancestrally, I come from a Sorry, how about now? One moment, please. If I speak like this, does it pick up on a mic? Can you hear it in the back? No. Uh, so I have to be like this. Okay. So uh, my family comes from a place where there, there aren't any treaties. I'm a second generation war refugee. Uh, my parents fled Vietnam. They were part of the first boat people exodus in 1975. So today I'm going to, well, Truth be told, this was a very challenging presentation to put together because I wanted to present something that spoke to the theme of today's gathering, sharing our knowledge. And certainly I could have talked about some of the projects that um, I've been involved in. And talked about kind of the technical aspect of it, but I didn't feel that was appropriate, mostly because it's not my story to tell. I view myself more, I mean, I know my title is technically senior archaeologist. I don't really like that title. It implies I know a lot, and I would say that I'm constantly learning. And I think that's important because when you call yourself, in my opinion, an expert, you're kind of assuming that you know everything, and I don't think that's the case. So I view myself more as kind of a navigator. I leverage my experience and my connections to help you achieve whatever, whatever your destination is, what you want to achieve. So if I'm not going to talk about the projects I've done, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about archaeology, but to talk about the archaeology, I, need, I needed to kind of first understand or get an idea of what the public perception of archaeology is. Certainly, if I talk archaeology to a bunch of archaeologists, there's a lot of things that are kind of just implied. I don't need to kind of explain a lot of things. And I don't think that is the right approach for something like this. So the first thing I did to um, kind of get an idea of that was I opened Google and I simply Googled something to the effect of archaeology, New Saskatchewan, and quickly read some of the stories that first popped up. And when I did that, I noticed that there were a lot of 
similar themes. So I thought the best approach and the best use of my time and what you may find value in is me talking about my perspectives in the context of regulatory archaeology in Saskatchewan. Um, as kind of Sarah alluded to this morning, different provinces have different set of rules and it's, it makes the work that a lot of Indigenous communities and nations are trying to accomplish a little more difficult. I mean, it's difficult to begin with, and then now you have this varying levels of legislation, it kind of complicates things. So I'm going to leverage my experience in Saskatchewan, and I, if I am successful in this, there should be some information, some pathways, I'm going to call them pathways, that your communities, your nations could use to achieve your desired goal in your journey to truth and reconciliation. So, as there is no surprise to anyone, a lot of the stories that pop up on the news about archaeology does paint it in a negative light. And I think it is important for archaeologists to understand that, and certainly I would say a lot of professional organizations and even varying levels of government universities are acknowledging that. Um, as my introduction alluded to, I'm involved with the Saskatchewan Association of Professional Archaeologists. I was a, a former president of the Saskatchewan Archaeological Society. And in my time during with those institutions, there was a lot of discussion about reconciliation. There was a lot of discussion about community-led projects. There was a lot of acceptance of things that were done in the past that were pretty shady, just to be blunt. But I would say, and not only to Saskatchewan, but across Canada, there is a growing movement, recognition, understanding of archaeologists to not only accept and accept the responsibilities of projects that were done to be bluntly unethically, but to come up with pathways to ensure that those those events do, do not happen again, and to involve the communities and the nations as much as possible. So what you see up here is the Canadian Archaeological Association. Uh, they had struck in a, a, a committee, essentially, to come up with resources for Indigenous communities concerning investigation of my markers. I'm going to talk about that again because officially, when we're talking about geophysical studies, it's technically not archaeology when you put it in the frame of provincial legislation. But I would suggest if you're looking for resources and wanting to learn more about these technologies, this is a great link. Um, it kind of occurred to me that you can't really access or um, yes, write these links down. So what I could do, if there is any interest, is I can present or provide a kind of a review Word document with all my bullet points on there. Nothing that I'm presenting on is confidential. All this information is available online. It's just a matter of knowing where to look. So I can certainly make that available. But to kind of just quickly show this, there's a lot of resources on the side. And it talks about kind of the ethics behind doing unmarked grave studies in the context of archaeology. So caution. I, I mentioned that I'm going to talk about or leverage my experience to come up with ways to present pathways that you could use if you wanted to use archaeology as a tool to complete unarmed grave studies. It's not the only way. I mean, across Turtle Island, we've heard lots of, there's lots of stories coming out. Certainly some of these are done by archaeologists, but a lot of them are, a lot of them are done by engineers. And what I've noticed, at least in Saskatchewan, that there is some misconceptions that a GPR survey or geophysical, which is what it's um, part of in terms of disciplines, is considered archaeology. There's a little bit of a gray area. So 
I'm going to talk about legislation. It's a lot of information, and I'm, I'm no politician. I'm certainly not a lawyer. I don't have any law training. But in my observations of during my career, looking at different bodies of legislation, I noticed that they are worded very precisely. And you know, you, you see those sentences where it's kind of long and rambly, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but all those words are there for a reason. So there's a lot of nuance that if you leverage your experience properly, you can navigate around it. Um, I tried to abbreviate some of the points where I could, but some points I left essentially verbatim, so I essentially cut and pasted from the legislation. And I'm saying that I'm letting you know that right now because the language could be upsetting, but I don't think I would be doing you a service if I didn't point it out. So just keep that in mind while we're going through here. So archaeology in Saskatchewan. I'm going to be talking about provincial legislation. Now, probably one of the thoughts that you're thinking is, well, a lot of these sites are actually on reserve land, federal land. So what is the legislation there? Officially, as of now, there is no federal legislation that specifically deals with archaeology and artifacts. There is one, there's a federal legislation that um, is called the, uh, the Impact Assessment Act, and it talks about archaeology briefly, but it mentions it, it mentions it in terms of a value component, which is basically for environmental impact assessments, bigger projects, a value component would basically be vegetation, wildlife, aquatics, air noise, things that could be negatively affected. That's the only piece of the legislation, as far as I know, that talks about archaeology federally. So on federal lands, on reserve land, the, I guess the, the common process is that you use the provincial legislation as a guiding document. So in a way, it gives a little more flexibility in maneuvering around the legislation, but also leveraging it to a way that could be beneficial to what the objective is. So when I'm talking about the legislation, just keep that in mind that there are differences, um, but you don't have to follow it if it's on federal land. You can certainly use parts of it to your advantage. <clears throat> so we've probably seen lots of stories like this where archaeology has gone wrong, conceivably. What I find interesting in stories like this is that, and I can see how the perception is that there may be this idea of kind of ethics involved. I mean, you can see in the first sentence there, it mentions the word significance, and then at the bottom, it says this office has no concern with the project proceeding as planned. So I want to just touch on this briefly because it can apply to some of the, I guess, initiatives that your nations or your communities are undertaking. In Saskatchewan, the body of legislation that governs archaeology is called the Heritage Property Act. The best way to think about it is that it's a box. The rules are predefined. Archaeologists have very limited flexibility in navigating outside that box. We don't set the thresholds, we don't set the expectations. We're just expected to meet the criteria that are mentioned in the legislation. So heritage property. At, at the beginning of most bodies of legislation, there are definitions. And heritage property is what we're, where archaeology falls. So there's actually three components to it. The first one is archaeological objects. I don't need to go into a whole lot of detail about that. I feel that it's pretty self-explanatory. The second one is paleontological objects, fossils. The third one kind of encompasses the two, but it adds a whole bunch of other um, 
criteria to it. So there, again, there's a little bit of flexibility in terms of what can actually constitute a heritage property. Now, if we're talking about archaeology in terms of industry, such as the slide before, we're actually talking about section 63. So essentially, there's a process, as I kind of alluded to, where branches of government will take a project and kind of run down this list to see what, what checks off and what doesn't apply. And if you meet a certain threshold, a, uh, a letter will be issued which says that a heritage resource impact assessment, heritage resource impact mitigation, some sort of archaeological work needs to be done. So that's the first part of these. Again, those are just the acronyms for the types of projects that I'm talking about. After you do the project, you write a report. The report summarizes everything about the anticipated impacts of the project, the methods, the results, and above all, the recommendations. So the recommendation is if we did find, an archaeologist did find a heritage property, we have to provide a recommendation that either basically tries to govern the next step of the process. But the reports are, view, are reviewed by the provincial government. So there's a part in there where it's actually a bit of a back and forth, um, I don't want to say negotiation, but coming to a mutual understanding of what a proper recommendation was. Things, things usually, recommendations are usually avoidance. That's first and foremost. We try to avoid it as much as possible. If it's not avoidable, then they talk about significance, as the last slide indicated. Significance is actually kind of the wrong word to use. I don't think it's it's misleading. And the Saskatchewan Association of Professional Archaeologists are talking to the provincial government about it right now to say you need to do something else. Because what they're talking, what they're trying to say is the interpretive potential. So in archaeology, it's all about you know the site can tell you a little more about past life ways. That's kind of the high level. Again, I do apologize. I'm trying to cover a lot of information. So if there's any questions, feel free to throw your hand up. Totally, uh, totally won't bother me at all. Third point is about the mitigation that I previously mentioned. So this is, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about this, but this basically summarizes that process I talked about, that there's a checklist that the government refers to, and depending on what parts of that list are checked off, a uh, project would require archaeology, it would not. Artifacts. And we've heard a little bit about this this morning, and I mean, certainly in my career, I've heard a lot about it in terms of where do they go, how come they don't go back to where they belong. And again, good old Google kind of summarizes that nicely. So I did block off some names, and it's not necessarily because I'm trying to protect anyone or take any credit away or anything like that. Um, I did that purposely to focus on the words itself, the themes, the thoughts, because my feeling is that if one person thought it, then a lot of people did it. So as you can see in the, the news clipping at the bottom, there's mention of federal legislation to keep artifacts in home communities and then stricter law, stricter control through federal laws. So if we talk about kind of the provincial and the federal context again, that's where, in my opinion, a lot of these discussions kind of, there's not a lot of movement because if it's on provincial land, you're trying, if you're trying to talk about federal policies in, in the context of heritage and archaeology, you're not going to be very successful. But, and I'll get back to this. Again, another news article talking about outdated laws and policies that affect ability to manage artifacts. So now we're actually talking about a different body of legislation. It's called the Rural Saskatchewan Museum Act. Um, 
You might, again, this is part of the definitions. Notice how it doesn't say artifacts, but it kind of characterizes it as sacred and culturally sensitive objects. I don't need to go down those bullets, again, because I don't feel like I have the authority to tell you what's sacred or not. I'm just, again, merely summarizing what is in the act. Section five specifically talks about the role of the museum, collect, preserve, conserve, restore. So in the prairies, a lot of the materials that we find are lithics. So stone tools, they preserve very well in the soil. Organics, leather, stuff like that, they don't preserve very well. Especially if you kind of go into the boreal forest, you know, Prince Albert North, and even in kind of little bluffs of, of um, Aspen and such. The soil is a little more acidic. Things don't preserve very well. So it's challenging for an archaeologist because when you pull, if you are lucky enough to uncover one of something that is an organic, like a piece of leather, let's say. The moment you pull that out of the soil, it starts to decompose at a rapid pace. I actually don't even have the expertise needed to control that. There's a whole different area of expertise that's needed to to ensure the preservation of these of these of those types of artifacts. Section five also says that the Royal Saskatchewan Museum assumes responsibility ownership of the Crown and Raider Saskatchewan. So officially, as the legislation is phrased right now, anything that is recovered on provincial land is property of the Crown. This one is interesting. I mean, you'll notice how they avoid saying Aboriginal sacred and culturally sensitive objects and they kind of generally refer to it as museum material. So again, there's a lot of, in my opinion, as far as I can tell, a lot of the language is picked specifically to, I don't want to say complicate things, but maybe to protect them. If we're talking about repatriation, you're going to want to look at section, section six. So, and it talks about policies, developing policies um, to access, care, use, and repatriate cultural and sensitive objects. The three points in the below are verbatim from the legislation. Yes. Um, just on the last slide, you mentioned um, that any artifacts that were covered on provincial land is property of the Crown, but what about non-reserved that's on federal land? Would that also be? No. Okay. So it's not like you can just go to the Crown and get rid of it. No. So on the, I guess the accepted process for anything on federal land is that there's always a recommendation to use provincial legislation as a guiding document. So anything that is recovered on federal land, it's up to the communities and the nations to decide where those go. Okay. You can default to provincial, but there is a little bit of flexibility. I think maybe the best way to answer this is to kind of refer back to the objective of what the community and the nations are trying to achieve with doing work on federal land. So to be blunt, if you didn't want to report, you didn't have you don't have to, then there's nothing the provincial government can really do on that sense, as far as I can tell. But there's always a recommendation, and there are some benefits of reporting archaeological sites on federal land because it does go into a database, and that database is used by the provincial government to evaluate whether projects are required or not, those, those HRIAs and HRIAMs that I'm talking about. So if there's no report, if it's not reported, and it's not, not, not documented, it's not documented, they can't use that to, in some cases, kind of tip the point to say that an 
archaeology is required on there. And there's always a buffer too, right? So I'm not talking about just on reserve land. Some sites will kind of trigger a bigger buffer, and if a project on provincial land is near that, then the site on federal land can help tip the scale to require work over here on provincial land. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, the three points at the bottom are straight from the Act. Again, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail of them. Um, maybe just kind of point out some interesting wording, the first one, regardless of where those objects are held. Again, if, if the repatriation of artifacts is something that the communities and nations are interested in, now we look into Section 6 a little more. <clears throat> so one mark grades. I kind of alluded to this at the beginning, but when we're talking about G or GPR, it's actually just one of the many um, pieces of technology that geophysics use when they're doing geophysical studies. So we're usually they're um, done in the context of engineering. Certainly, and I mean, this, even the Canadian Archaeological Association, myself, and many other archaeological states, the applications of benefits of this technology to archaeology is immense. But what I will say is if you're, you, it, it is inaccurate to say that. A geophysical survey is an archaeological assessment. It, it doesn't, well, I mean, I'm just going to be blunt here. The only way, as, sorry, <laughs> the provincial government will only consider something an archaeological study if there is subsurface exploration. Especially in the context of residential school, I am pretty confident that it's not what a lot of communities and nations want to proceed. So, if you are trying to frame your study right off the bat under archaeology and the focus is only to use geophysical exploration, it's not going to work. But I'm going to go back. I'm going to come back to that point later because I don't want it. It sounds kind of bleak, but there's always a way. It just takes a little bit of creativity and leveraging experience. <clears throat> so again, oh yes, sorry. Well, archaeology, by definition, is uh, a focus on objects and things, right? So when you're doing a geophysical survey, you're identifying anom interest areas in the ground that could potentially indicate that something is there. What that something is, is to be determined. So, I mean, I guess what I would try to say is, If you're going to use archaeology as a tool for your investigations, you have to have a destination in mind. And what I mean by destination is a site designation that offers some sort of protection. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But on a high level, geophysical in the province of Saskatchewan is not considered archaeology. It's considered a geophysical assessment. But this article kind of pulls on that a little bit too, because I'm seeing a lot of archaeologists leveraging geophysical work and, and encountering issues about permitting and being kind of confused why it's not considered. It. So the quote below, I mean, it talks a little bit. About it. The technology is typically used for construction, building, maintenance, engineering work. 
may not be able to do the final work needed properly to document a graveyard. I would go a little further into that. I would go as far as to say that the, you need a certified geophysicist. You should have a certified geophysicist completing a geophysical survey. Um, I might have 16 years of experience as a professional archaeologist. I certainly don't know how to interpret this information. It's also incredibly finicky, depending on your soil conditions, depending on if you're in the middle of a field or in an urban area, all these things can affect how those devices collect data. Because you're talking about kind of radio waves, for example. So if you're in the middle of a city, think of all the waves from all the varying types of devices that are circulating around it. They're interfering with the data that's being collected. Now, when it comes to processing data, I try to get um, my colleague, geophysicist, that has about 16 and 17 years of experience in this to explain to me, and I was just left confused. Essentially, it spits it out in an Excel table with a whole bunch of numbers, and then there's another process that you use to convert that into an image. And you know, some of the images you've seen previously, my first slide had an image of an EM survey, but I'm certainly not qualified to interpret that. Also, when you are removing what they call noise, so those radio frequencies and those other interfering waves, every time you remove the data or remove that noise, you're inadvertently also removing data. So it's about having that experience to leverage, to understand the threshold that you need to achieve to not inadvertently erase data that could be essential to what you're trying to achieve, essentially. So where archaeology will come into play is the focus on historic and archival research, identifying where buildings could have, where buildings were, what subsurface features are there, and using that with other lines of evidence to come up with a picture that can more accurately say what is there, what's not there. Again, I know it's a little confusing because I just finished saying that it doesn't count as archaeology, but there is a, a process, so you just bear with me. <clears throat> so this next slide I'm going to talk about, again, I'm going to apologize for some of, I guess, the terms, but in an instant where an unmarked grave was exposed, and if there was a decision made to move, repatriate that uh, that individual, what kind of acts you may be looking at. So the first one is the disease control regulation, part of the public the public health act, I believe. Section 30 talks about uh, disinterment. It's about a permit. And there's a couple things that say you need a permit if you're doing this, but if you're moving it within the same area, you might not need to. Again, if it's something that may be relevant to what it is you're trying to achieve, I will get into that. The Cemeteries Act, and we talked about, or Sarah mentioned this a little bit in the morning. The Cemeteries Act is, it's, archaeologists come across the Cemeteries Act quite a bit, but it's not actually part of the Heritage Property Act. So the Heritage Property Act does talk about an archaeological burial and the process that is required, protocols and procedures needed to deal with those. The Cemeteries Act talks more specifically about getting a cemetery recognized and some of the, I guess, funding and maintenance cabinets to come along with that. So it's actually, from my understanding, managed by the National Consumer Affairs Authority. Don't ask me why. Various Property Act, I'm talking about Section 65. In human remains that are not found in a recognized cemetery, Another document that you're going to want to look into is the Archaeological Burial Management Policy. It's more geared towards professionals, but I feel like there's a lot of information in there that would be beneficial and maybe help contextualize and understand some of the things that you know, a professional archaeologist may be doing in Saskatchewan that seems kind of out of the norm. Likely, they're working under this burial management policy. Again, all of these acts are available online. None of this is privilege um, access only. It's all public knowledge. 
<clears throat> so I was talking about how for these studies that are being accomplished or being undertaken, if, if archaeology is a tool that your communities and nations want to leverage, I would say it is critically important to understand, not understand, but have an idea of what the goal is, aside from, of course, the truth and reconciliation. But in terms of recognizing or protecting, commemorating these, these sites, I'm not in a position to tell you which way is the right way or the wrong way. I'm merely presenting information for you to consider. So if we're talking about site designations in the Heritage Property Act, there's a couple of options. So the first three at the bottom there, Municipal Heritage Conservation District, Municipal Heritage Property, Provincial Heritage Property. A lot of these are kind of talking, I mean, are talking about a lot of historic buildings, things like that. And this link up here, this is where this information goes, by the way. If you, no, it's not working. It's an interactive GIS-based platform accessible by anybody through the Heritage Conservation Branch website. And it shows you exactly where these things are, these sites are. It has a little blurb of what it is and what the significance is. There's, there's a fourth one called Preservation Agreement. I purposely left that out because it's included in that database, but I can't find any reference to it specifically in the app. So I mentioned it here because it's in the database, but I can't actually speak to what that means because I'm frankly I, I I'm not sure what it is. Probably something equivalent to a uh, conservation easement, I assume, but that's all presumptuous. Another designation you can consider is a provincial archaeological site designation. So that's an archaeology site. There is a database, however, it is secure. Only professional archaeologists can access it. And a lot of the concerns raised by, again, the Saskatchewan Association of Professional Archaeologists, the Saskatchewan Archaeological Society, is, and the Heritage Conservation Branch as well, is not disclosing the location of these to prevent mischief. Again, to kind of pivot back to the the destination should be articulated before you decide to leverage archaeology. So this one is specifically about Lower Hudson House. I don't know a whole lot about the site. I believe it's a fur tree post from the late 1700s. I'm not going to comment on the story itself, but I want to talk about the provincial heritage property and what that would mean. So there's actually three parts to it. Again, language is interesting. 39 talks about a real property, 45 a personal property, and 55 a heritage property. So the heritage property is defined. The other two are literally ambiguous. So there is a process. Essentially, it starts with a notice and reason to the owner, registering an interest with land titles, publishing a notice in the Gazette, and notice in at least one newspaper in the local area. I believe it's about a 30-day process for that part, and, but there's also a caveat for if someone who does oppose that designation, there is also a period. I'm going to say 30 days, but don't quote me on that. I, can't, I, I don't remember exactly, but the point of this slide is that that's the process, and there is a period after that where uh, an objection could be registered. So the benefits, legal protection, eligibility for funding, and access to conservation advice. There is a website. Again, if there is interest, I can compile this into a, a Word document and make it accessible for anyone who's interested. Now to kind of stick it back to um, Sarah's presentation this morning, another designation you can leverage the municipal heritage designation. Again, I don't believe it's my place 
to direct you into a particular designation. And I feel that that news clipping at the bottom summarizes quite nicely. This is a discussion that needs to be community-based. Anything, I would say, should be community-led first and foremost. An archaeologist is really, I don't, I don't even like the word technical expert, but there is a level of knowing that can only be attained through a university setting. Similar to an engineer, um, a biologist, uh, ecologist. Now, I'm not saying, so I guess archaeology is about the thing. So that's, that it's essential to kind of pivot back to that and kind of sit on that for a bit. In terms of interpretation, that's actually where I would say having the community involved right off the bat is essential because it offers a different interpretation of a site. So I was involved in a project a couple of years ago and I was on a, I was, I was in the field with a community member and we identified what's called the stone cairn. So stone cairn in archaeology speak is basically a pile of rocks that could be many things. It could be essentially kind of like a waypoint. It could be a resource cache. It can also be a burial. Typically, these features are on a high place. So it's observable from this, uh, a considerable distance. This one was actually kind of in a low area, but it exhibited a lot of the characteristics that would suggest that it was quite old. And I was talking to uh, this member and I was explaining that to him. And what he said was so simple, but also so insightful to me. And I've never actually looked at archaeology the same way again. And he said, well, why can't it just be kids? Kids can't move rocks up that hill. You know, when you're at a, a, a ceremony, kids are running around, they're picking up sticks, they're moving in, they're, they're doing kid things. So I look at this and I see a bunch of small rocks that could have been moved by a child. Is that an explanation? Absolutely. So that community involvement is essential to making the interpretation have more validity. Another example is um, projectile points. I don't know if anyone has ever tried flick napping. It's incredibly hard. It takes a lot of skill, a lot of patience, a lot of trial and error. But in the archaeological literature, we have really small projectile points, and they're commonly referred to as toy points. So the idea is that it was made by a child. And he, I, I explained that to him, and said, well, why couldn't it be made for the little people or by the little people. Again, something I never considered and it changed the way I looked at it. So that community involvement is absolutely critical, even though it's technically not required in legislation. So moving back to the municipal heritage property, section 11 talks about a municipal heritage property and a municipal heritage conservation district. Subtle difference Conservation district talk, I believe, refers to an area that could potentially hold a heritage property. And of course, they have to throw it in a bunch of caveats, notwithstanding the Planning and Development Act. Process, municipal heritage advisory committee, if applicable, notice of intention, uh, issuance in at least one newspaper in the area, and uh, notice of intention in the land registry. Yes, I mentioned these in the, in the morning, but publicly benefits are publicly formally recognizing heritage property value, courage, good stewardship, so you know, establishing controls, guidelines to preserve the site. Grass mowing can be one of those. And eligibility for funding. More information there. So a possible pathway. And as an archaeologist with 16 years of nature, if I can be Truthful and honest, I'm actually surprised that this pathway hasn't been suggested by 
other archaeologists working in these settings. Section 64, site of special nature. So what a site of special nature is referring to is things like rock art sites, medicine wheels, burial grounds. There's the passage. So the first part, no person shall destroy, desecrate, deface. The second one is no person shall remove, excavate, or alter without approval from the minister. So what a site of special nature is, as you can probably extrapolate, is anything that has immense cultural significance. Um, SAPA, Saskatchewan Association of Professional Archaeologists, is currently talking to the provincial government about adding more sites into this category. A vision quest site is an example of that. It's not included as a site of special nature. So you're probably wondering how you could achieve this designation if that is the pathway you want to explore, but geophysical does not is not considered an archaeological assessment. You take a historic archaeology approach. So in Plains archaeology and, and across the world as well, there's essentially the archaeological history can be broken into kind of two segments. The first one is what is referred to as pre-contact archaeology. You might hear terms like Paleo-Indian, but essentially anything before contact. Historic archaeology is really anything after contact. In Saskatchewan, we're talking about farmsteads, homesteads, colonialism, things like that. Again, this is quite loosely defined in the regulations of Heritage Property Act. It's different from the legislation. And different provinces have different criteria. In BC, I believe, I've never worked in BC, but I think it's about 1856, anything that is after 1856 doesn't qualify as a historic archaeology site. So a lot of historic mining sites, Japanese internment camps are not preserved or not protected. In Alberta, I believe it's a 50 year floater. So 2023, a bungalow from 1972 could classify as a historic archaeology site. In Saskatchewan, <coughs> it's a ballpark cut off of pre-1945. So if you can demonstrate that a lot of the historical significance that happened at the site was mostly before 1945, you've checked off one thing, uh, one of the criteria that you can present as an argument. Second one is archival historical data. I see that a lot of the projects going on are using that, so you're well on your way there. Impact archaeological features. This is where the geophysical component can come into play, because as we kind of talked about this morning and now. Geophysical assessments can only indicate that there is something slightly different in the ground. What that is, we don't know. But if you take a historic archaeological approach, leveraging archival and historical data, you could potentially find areas where old settlers, foundations, refuse pits, these features like that are found. Now you have something tangible in the ground that is archaeological. In my mind, there's an argument there to have a site preserved as a site of special nature. Um, kind of on a broader regulatory framework talking about criteria that government use, a site of special nature has quite a big buffer so if you're looking at a map, they basically draw a bigger circle around it and anything in that checks off that check mark in that checklist. Um, in industry, and going back to section 63 of reports that we have to file with the government, one of the protections offered in, um, by a site of special nature is that we can't actually disclose where that is. So if we have a map, it's a requirement. We have to have a map of with the project area in the middle and a buffer of an area around it. Even if the site of special nature is pretty close to it but not affected by the project, we don't have we don't we're not supposed to apply it. So that information 
is not known to the public. The only way that location would be disclosed is if a project was specifically dealing with that site. So I leave that in your hands. Again, I don't feel that my job is to tell you which way is the right way, the wrong way. These are discussions that have to be done at the community level, at the nation level. Um, an archaeologist, any technical expert, should their role should only be to navigate you to achieve what your desired goal, what your desired outcome is. Um, so to kind of end it, this is not a residential school. This is a project completed in industry. That's a GPR. That's a GPR plan view. Those red squares are outlines of buildings that we were able to identify through our archival research. So I just wanted to present that just to kind of give a little more context since I had a slide at the beginning that had EM data. So that is my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yes. Excuse me, can we ask you to come up and turn on the mic so everybody in the room can hear your question? These little mics in front of you folks, if you just hit the one button, then you can you can have access to the poll room so we can all hear the questions that are being asked. Thank you. Yeah, just, just hop over. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, with this, the section 64 of that act that you were talking about, um, with the, like we have found some like tunnel systems with the, with the get ground penetrating radar, would those count as historical sites for archaeology? Like would they, would they count as what you were just talking about? The cultural significance? <laughs> I would, I mean, I, in my mind, it absolutely constitutes an historic archaeological site. Um, if the argument is to try to designate it as a site of special nature, there needs to be pretty strong archival evidence or even contextual evidence that you can leverage, if that makes sense. So, yeah. yeah, it does. So to go about like the funding for that, you would need archival evidence, the ground penetrating radar, and like if we we're wanting to apply for that because you said there was a possible pathway for is that funding no it's not funding it's um it's the end result of any archaeological inquiry it's one of many many designations that you can achieve so i mean depending on i guess the financial side of um the organization the organization that's trying to accomplish that there are funding options that you can apply for, I, I believe. So the Saskatchewan Association of Professional Archaeologists and the Saskatchewan Archaeological Society do have funding programs in place. Um, I believe now it's quite tailored towards students and professional archaeologists, but I believe there is discussions to kind of expand that to any type of archaeological inquiry. And if that's not the case, I would argue that it absolutely should be, because the point of those findings is to make achieving or completing archaeological investigations more, more of a reality. Right. So to apply for funding, then, like, because I did a quick search on that website as well, and it was mainly for students mm -hmm. or PhD, like, um, like postdocs, kind of. So would we then have to apply for funding with? With a, with a professor from a university, like an archaeology professor from a university, or how can we get funding to do this project? If I could be frank, what I would do is just send an email straight to the SAPA um, email account and ask them to clarify. So they are in the process of any body of legislation, policy, should be considered a living document, I would say. So even though it might not be in the Constitution or a uh, policy right now, 
I don't see any harm in suggest asking why. Because again, perceptions are important and any discipline I would say has a tendency to kind of default to the second nature of that makes sense. Things kind of just become inherent and there is an element of um, complacency I suppose too. And sometimes you need an outside perspective to initiate change. So if it was me, I would send an email to that detailing as much detail as you can what the project is and what you're trying to achieve because there are ways I would say to work around that. I have several other questions, so if anybody else wants to ask a question, I'm going to offer it. Do we have a time? Do we have a time limit? Well, we want to have Star Monkey present next. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're going to have a five minute break and then move into Star Monkey. I can make myself available after Great. the last presentation. Awesome. So, Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Tam, for that presentation. And thank you for the questions. That's wonderful. This is that opportunity to hear the information, uh, to take that in, what's relevant for you and your community and the work that we're all doing. So appreciate, appreciate that. We are going to um, take a five minute break before we go into our last session for the afternoon. Uh, I do have a, a small announcement or, or a question. Um, we have a set of missing keys in the building. So if anyone has come across um, a set of keys, it's just a regular set with a gray fob. Um, if you could just, if you come across it, bring it up to the front or bring it to me, that would be great uh, to me or Sarah here. And um, yeah, just, we don't know it could be in this building out in a multi-purpose room, but if, if anyone comes across that, if you could please bring them to the front, that would be great. So we'll do a quick five-minute break. Okay, so it's 2.01, so yeah, two, we'll come back here uh, five after two, just a really quick stretch break, and uh, we'll get set up for the next presentation, and we'll see you back here shortly. Thank you. I checked my friend of my own.
Searched my car. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. okay. All right. Here's the presentation. So whichever one it goes into this one. Here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Honestly. Sure. Uh, is there one on that side? You can take it the presentation, right? Yeah, I'll set it. <laughs> yeah, this one here? Okay. Yeah, that's the only one. Okay. The rest is just photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go
I have to say all of the things to make sure um, yeah, it's fine. Like good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm always really so particular about how I introduce people to make sure that well, Okay, so we're going to get started in about two or three minutes. So we'll just start rounding some people up and uh, we'll get started um, with our last presentation for the afternoon. Thank you. 
short break and got to stretch a little bit, get some fresh air. Uh, it's been a, a long uh, but informative day and appreciate those of you who are still with us and um, here to learn more and, and take this uh, information uh, back home to our communities and the work that we do. So um, we've got our, our last presentation here. Uh, we've got three presenters to share uh, on behalf of the Star Blanket Cree Nation search team. Uh, we'll start with Sheldon Patra. Sheldon Patra is a member of Star Blanket Cree Nation. He has worked for his community for many years in a number of different capacities. Previously, he worked in the capacity of Director of Social Development, Human Resources, and currently as Director of Operations. Prior to these positions, Sheldon sat as an elected official for his community. He is also a residential school survivor who attended LeBret Residential School from 1987 to 1991. Prior to this, his parents, grandparents, and their parents attended the residential school, making him the fourth generation to have been at the school. Currently, he is the project lead for the Star Blanket Cree Nation Ground Search Project team. He and his wife are parents to six children, and he is the proud mushroom of two amazing grandchildren. He eagerly shares his journey and experience with nations who are embarking on this sacred work. Recently, he has presented at a conference on unmarked graves, hosted by Calais' First Nation, as well as with the members of Fort Albany in Ontario. And finally, and it is on his bio, he wants everyone to know that he's real deadly too. In all caps. <laughs> I asked him, I said, is this, how's his bio? You keep that in. <laughs> I've heard rumors he's real deadly too, so it's too many presentation. <laughs> Uh, but it's not just going to be Sheldon. We have two other presenters with us as well for this uh, presentation. Stephanie Belgar from Little Black Bear First Nation uh, here locally. And she's one of the assistant researchers for the LRIS, the Lower Indian Residential School Project, employed by Star Blanket Cree Nation. And she'll be joined by Adele Vivo, who is also one of the assistant researchers for LRIS, uh, employed by Star Blanket Cree Nation. And she's joining us from Saskatoon. So. Uh, they too are real deadly. I just chatted with them too, and they like because they're working with Sheldon, they're all working together, and I'm like, oh, the deadliness must rub off because they seem pretty awesome to me too. So, anyway, they're going to share uh, for our final presentation for the afternoon. <laughs> Thank 
Thank you for that intro. Your check is over there <laughs> at my desk. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my piece of this will be pretty quick uh, so we can get into the presentation with uh, Stefan and Adele here. But uh, uh, I, I find as we do this work and the work that we've done for the past year and a half, our, our project team, a lot of them are here today. Uh, there is a little bit, and I shared this in, in some of our wellness uh, groups because just like Chief alluded to earlier, uh, you have to be able to take care of yourself when, when you're doing this type of work. Uh, it's, it's not easy. Like Chief Mint said, it's an emotional journey. There's a lot of things you have to consider. There's a lot of information and a lot of stuff that you have to hang on to for a long time making sure that everything is in place before you communicate that, that information so that that takes a toll on 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 everyone who's associated with our with our project team everyone's associated with, with the grounds that, that we're working on so um, we've been focusing lots lately on mental health and, and wellness and uh, it's, it's the new focus and it's something that all the projects uh, should be should be looking at uh, ways to look after themselves as as they continue that work, and uh, I share in the in our shared circles that for myself too, there's always a little bit of of guilt attached to the work that that we do because we're always triggering, we're we're always bringing information forward that that triggers you, whether you're a survivor or whether you're a, an intergenerational survivor. We we bring this information forward, and and we inadvertently stress people out. We inadvertently hurt them. We inadvertently make them remember whether it was their own personal experiences or whether it was stories that was passed down to them by their elders who who, who have maybe gone on. So I I always have that that feeling within me to to say sorry for for the survivors for the intergenerational survivors for anyone who carries something from those negative effects of residential school so i'm here again today you know there's lots of survivors in the room there's lots of intergenerational survivors you know sorry sorry for the work that has to happen sorry for the for, for the work that that leads to the truth of, of what's 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 beneath the surface in each of our projects, not just here at Lorette, but all of our projects. I'm happy to see Barb. She was just in here. Causes they helped us uh, get started. They invited us to their lands and and shared with us the things that that they did and how they got going. And because of that, we were able to get started based off of their trials, their tribulations, their challenges, what they learned, uh, it, put us, it put us that far ahead so that we didn't have to learn as they did. And then as, as they read, you know, we're more than happy to share that information. We're not saying we're experts, but we'll just share our experiences. If there's other projects that are starting up and they want to, they want to check in with us and, just to see what, what we did and what our experiences are. You know, we're more than happy to, to share that because we're all in this together. We have our separate separate projects, but we're after the same thing, and that's truth. Truth is to what happened at those, at those sites. So with that, uh, now that I brought everyone down, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into some, some presentation here. Uh, this is... Uh, more or less the presentation that we that we shared with uh, Chief uh, Archibald, F uh, AFN Chief Archibald, she she uh, came to the, to the site and she visited and she paid her respects and and we gave her uh, uh, a quick report uh, just to it, it was it was an intimate visit we didn't make a, a big deal out of it or anything like that uh, we didn't even have any media there uh, she just wanted to come in and pay her respects so. 
uh, we were grateful she took some time to do that uh, with us and visit with us there. And we had a meal together, and, and uh, the research team here uh, gave, gave this presentation to her. So uh, now I'll give this presentation to you guys. So um, our, our two of our research team here, uh, Stefan and Elle, will, will take us through the timeline of uh, the Rivers Initial School. Thank you. I'm Stephanie Belder. <laughs> this is my first time doing an introduction in Cree, so bear with me. Um, Tansi Kiwao, Adel Nitsiga Sun, Treaty 7, Otimia, and uh, Saskatoon Treaty 6, Miwigan. Um, I'm very honored to be here as a guest on Treaty 4, and thank you to all of our um, elders here at Kateak and um, everyone who showed up and you know, is giving your day to um, be informed on on these topics that we're that we're talking about today. Okay, so the presentation um, today we're going to go. We're going to have a brief summary of the school, um, then the mission and land claims, the founding and funding. We're going to talk about the staff. Um, like the Grey Nuns and Oblates of Mary Immaculate, um, the recruitment of students, the treatment of students in these in this school, and uh, grades and schooling offered, fires, and then um, the closure of the of the school. So this is a summary of the school. The school had many names, including 1884 to 1907, Capel Roman Catholic Industrial School, 1885-1945, Capel Indian Industrial School, 1919-1936, Labrette Indian Industrial School, 1924-1966, Capel Indian Residential School, 1925-1965, Labrette Indian Residential School, 1969 to 1976, Copal student, student residence. 1982, Labrette, uh, 1982 to 1944, Copal Indian Residential School. 1994 to 1998, White Cat Collegiate. For the purpose of this presentation, we will refer to the school as LIRS. This IRS was funded by the Canadian federal government with the administration and running of the school given to the Catholic Church, missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate and the Grey Nuns. Bishop Pash bought the land from the Métis to build the school in 1883. The LIRS was one of the first industrial schools to open after the Davin Report in 1884 and the last to close in 1998. That's 114 years. Um, in 1819, Abbey Provencher was the first European colonizer to visit the Capel area and recorded in recorded European history. In 1864, Bishop Alexandra Taché traveled through the valley and identified the area as an excellent location for a Catholic mission. In October of 1865, Taché returned to the valley, staying in Fort Capel for four weeks, providing ministry services for the people of the area. During his stay, he officially named the site La Mission. Spring 1866, Abbey Richaud was sent to begin La Mission. He was the first priest in charge from 1866 to 1867. He built a chapel with poplar, with poplar logs. The chapel was then destroyed by fire in 1869, but rebuilt in 1870. The location, this location was part of a larger mission, the St. Laurent Mission, that had 32 posts in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Alberta. An Oak Lake missionary, 
uh, Father Jules de Corby arrived in 1868 and acted as a pastor for 500 families in the area. In 1871, he erected a cross to honor where Bishop Teche first entered the valley, which is where this picture is taken from. So the cross is kind of right here. And then you can see um, the, the church over there, and that's where, just over there is where the gym is. La Mission was then a place where missionaries traveled to serve and where people sought religious education. Mission. <laughs> Mission. <laughs> In 1880, Father Huguenot took over for Father de Corby as the town pastor. In 1884, Father Huguenot then became the principal of the Coppell Industrial School, and Father Louise Lebrecht became the town pastor. Father Lebrecht changed the name of the church from Saint Florent to Sacré Cœur de Jesus. Sacred Heart of Jesus, apologies, I, I can't speak French so well. Father Lebret also applied to have a post office with the same name, but was rejected. And a senator tried to assist Lebret in the process. The senator applied for a post office to the address of Lebret, and Father Lebret was the first official postmaster and where the name of Lebret comes from. Land claims. July 21st, 1883, the Deputy Minister of Interior Ottawa wrote to an address of St. Boniface, Manitoba, discussing the land section 2, 11, and 14, which is now Wafe Mostosis. The letter also mentioned that this land has been occupied by a native, Denemi, for 17 years. The land was purchased by the mission under Bishop Hatch's name to build a QIRS for $625. January 12, 1884, Deputy Mis Minister of the Superintendent of Indian Affairs, Loris Kufenent, wrote in a letter that Bishop Hash reserved a quantity of land, 600 acres, to build the LIRS. And another letter from Akula Wash, a commissioner of Dominion of Lands in 1885 discussed that for an industrial school to properly succeed, they must place it in a location far from the village of Fort Capel. Walsh stated that there must be isolation and be removed from the attractions and allurements which are offered by proximity to a town or village, from which then the commissioner suggested NW14 of Section 2 of Fishing Lake and the west half of sections 11 and 14 townships 21 range west of the second murder <laughs> thank you <laughs> just going back to this last slide here um i believe that's the first yep. school that was built so that that was the the capel industrial school um founding and funding so free education was one of the agreements on treaty four the government was looking for a way to fulfill this agreement. Um, this was supposed to be in the form of one room schools on each reserve with one teacher provided. It was to learn to read and write, but not to sew, cook, clean, or work with machinery. The church also wanted to indoctrinate, indoctrinate Catholic beliefs into the children and had enough missionaries to teach, but not enough funding to create and support the schools. According to Sister Marcoux in 1955, the idea for Indian residential schools was conceived in 1880 by Bishop Grandin of Saskatchewan and Father Lacombe. This plan included the church, the church and its pupils teaching the children while the government funded the institutions. Lacombe and Grandin presented this to Taché and in 1883, Taché proposed the idea to the government where it was then accepted as a fulfillment of the DAB report. <laughs> There were now funds given to the church for three Indian residential schools. These three schools were built in Capel, Saskatchewan, Dunbow near Calgary, Alberta, and in Battleford in Saskatchewan. So just a little bit of an overview of the creation of the Indian residential schools. Um, these schools or institutions really uh, were predominantly funded and operated by the government of Canada 
um, and the Roman Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Presbyterian, and United Churches. To a lesser scale, some Indian residential schools were funded by provincial governments or by various religious orders. In 1920, amendments to the Indian Act made it mandatory for every Indian child between the ages of 7 and 16 years to attend Indian residential school. Although there are many accounts of children being taken much younger than 7 years old. In 1933, legal guardianship of the Indian children attending Indian residential school was assumed by the principals of the Indian residential schools upon forcible surrender of legal custody by parents. Okay, cool. Um, so the Grey Nuns and Oblates of Mary Immaculate. So the Grey Nuns, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Montreal last summer and go to the Grey Nuns um, archives in Montreal. And we learned a little bit there. Um, this picture on the left is St. Marguerite de Uville. Um, so she was the founder of Les Sœurs in Montreal. So the Grey, the Grey Nuns, the Grey Sisters. Um, and something that we learned while we were at the archives was um, GRI, so G-R-I-S-E-S, is actually kind of like a play on words for being drunk or drinking in French. Because these gray nuns would actually um, make like moonshine or alcohol. So then this was kind of like a nickname that they got um, and they just kind of went with it. So um, that was an interesting kind of thing that we learned there. Um, they were founded in 1737 by Saint, Saint Marguerite de Uville. Um, many of the staff of the LRS were gray nuns. Uh, the Oblates of Mary Immaculate were founded in 1816, so quite quite a bit after um, the Grey Nuns were founded um, by Father Eugene de Maisonot. Father Eugene uh, and four companions started a commun community in aix provence in France. Uh, there were many OMI who were also staff at the LIRS. These staff members were sometimes transferred back and forth from Gordon's, Muskaugan, and Maryvale Indian Residential School, among others. Staff. Reverend, Father, Rep, Reverend Father Huguenard was the first principal recommended by Archbishop Pax of St. Boniface and appointed by Sir John A. McDonald. Huguenard was accompanied by four women, Sister Lala Mueller, Sister Bergeron, and Sister St. Anard, stayed till 1905, and another unnamed sister. There were many great nuns who worked as teachers with survivors stating that all directly or indirectly contributed to the atrocities that happened in the school. There were also known convict, convicts hired as staff to this school. There are a detailed list of the principals and teachers at the school that coincide with survivors' negative experiences. Recruitment. In 1884, there were six boys recruited. 1885, there are 22. 1886, 45 boys and some girls housed in the attic until girls' quarters were built. These numbers vary from one account to the next, where the NCTR recorded 15 boys in 1886 and 55 students in 1885 to 1886. In 1887, there were 63 boys and 40 girls. After parents of students objected to the way their children were being treated and what they were learning in the schools, Huguenard made attendance compulsory for First Nations children. Huguenard had learned Cree in the eight years he had lived in the valley and was able to recruit more children to the school by speaking Cree. There are multiple accounts of forced removal of children by Huguenard. Up to 1889, there were less than 140 students who attended the school per year. After 1892 and the establishment of the per capita grant, there were at least 200 students a year until the school's closure in 1998. Highest number of children reported was 325 in 1964, with many years accommodating more students than the maximum number given to the school. Mm -hmm. 
So just for this first point here, um, you can see that this, there's only like, there's two different places that we're getting these kind of statistics from, and they vary drastically. So doing this archival research, as was presented on earlier uh, this morning, yeah, okay. Um, it's tough because you never actually know what information is the correct information. We don't even know if either of these are, you know, actually accurate. And it's the same with, um, you saw in the first or third slide, that there are so many different names for the school. So that's also been a bit of a barrier um, in applying for archives and things like that, because um, if we apply only, because I think we only had like three or four names when we first started this project. And so that's how we applied to archival you know, research. And now we have so many more and uh, we're gonna have to reapply now with those names as well because there might be some missing um, evidence at the archives that we weren't able to acquire before. So the treatment, the treatment of the students. Uh, the students at the school were not given proper food, clothing or medical attention. There were many children who died of tuberculosis as a result of poor living conditions and lack of treatment directly caused by Huguenot and Dubny, um, the Indian commissioner at the time. From 1884 to 1891, it's reported that the LIRS discharged 173 students and that 71 or 40.8% had passed away in those seven years. Principal Huguenard and Principal Leonard in 1922 both argued at different times that the students who were sick with tuberculosis should not leave the school to receive medical treatment, that there was no better place for them to be other than the school, even though there was a hospital and a sanatorium dedicated for tuberculosis at that time. Children were punished for speaking Nahia Weiwen you want to say that one? No. I know French. She knows Korean. Um, <laughs> in the schools, even though many did not speak English or French. Many children were abused at the LIRS, and there were influenza and various diseases and illnesses, illness breakouts nearly yearly from 1890 to 1957. So usually we would say that we're not going to read all this out because it's generalized for theory, I guess. Yeah. But these are the grades within the years that's been offered at the QIRS or the LIRS. So I don't know. Yeah, you, can just, just, you can just see like the first you know year only three grades were offered at the school even though it was supposed to be a school you know that's covering these things that were like the treaty promises so or treaty agreements but they're only offering grades one to three and then the next several years it fluctuates between one to five and one to six um and it doesn't get up to grade 12 until 1951. And then it just fluctuates throughout all the years from then until 1985. Schooling. Special, <laughs> special programs that were offered at the school included carpentry, farming, baking, blacksmithing, sewing, and housework. These were divided between the students to enforce strict gender roles with the girls learning sewing, housemaking, and baking, and the boys learning farming, carpentry, and blacksmithing. Fires at the LIRS. The school was first destroyed by fire in 1904 and was rebuilt by 1906 against the advice of W.R. Tucker Moose Woods Day School principal, who provided a list of, of the students from the reserve where he worked, who had died while attending the Coupel School, as well as other industrial schools. The school burnt down again in 1932, rebuilt and functioning in 1936. This school was built with bricks and fire-retarded materials. 
The Labrette Seminary was built in 1926. That would be that would be the seminary right there. Closed in the 1960s and burnt down in October of 1982. This will be the seminary. Closure. The Oblet Fathers left in 1974 and the Gray Nuns left in 1975-1976. The school was handed over to the government in 1974. 1981, the Capel Labrette IRS Adver Advisory Council, QIRSC, received full responsibility of the operation of the school from the federal government. 1983, the Star Blanket Band took title of the LIRS lands under treaty land entitlement. 1984, the LIRS became non-denominational. Non-denominational. The school closed in 1998 under the name of White Cap Collegiate. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the one. We can answer any questions if anybody has any questions or comments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. So a lot of information there. Uh, lots of considerations for the project team now moving forward. Uh, we're very interested to see uh, what, uh, what archaeological kind of information would look like. Uh, Aside from unmarked graves and, and areas of interest and everything like that, we do have uh, uh, non gravesite related areas that we're finding on the site. So, uh, considering you know uh, excavating those and, and using archaeological techniques to to dig uh, down and expose those underground areas is something that uh, that we're considering. Um, it's a lot of uh, a lot of work. Uh, ever since the uh, the announcement back on January twelfth, we've been given, we've been receiving a lot of uh, communication. On, you know, what's next? What are you guys going to do? Did you make decisions on this? Did you make decisions on that? And uh, uh, we're here to, I guess, kind of ask everyone for for patience. Uh, a lot of this work is going to take time. It's, it's not a quick turnaround by any means on, on any of these pieces that we have to consider. We may be years uh, before we can, we can determine anything. Uh, there's a lot of community consultation. There's a lot of student survivor consultation. There's a lot of pieces that have to happen. Uh, uh, the project team is currently working on revamping our, our current work plan and proposal to the government uh, to the Missing Children Fund. Uh, we want to extend that proposal now beyond our original time frame uh, because the commitment that the government gave us when we started this was that we would fund you up to discovery first and, and foremost. They, they didn't want to commit any dollars beyond that upfront because they wanted to, it's a wait and see approach is, is, what, they, is what they took. Well, since January 12th, we've discovered so now we're, we're modifying our work plan, our budget plan, our proposal uh, to, to go beyond the original time frame. So that's years where we're contemplating years now in the future. And I think someone else said it here that it may be work that the younger ones might have to learn how to do. Uh, that that's how long we're we're considering now moving forward with a lot of these a lot of these different pieces. It's not going to be a quick turnaround on who, what, when, where, why, it's, it's going to take time. So that's the message, I guess, in my final words, uh, that we're asking for, for patience. 
you know, it's it's not it's not going to be quick answers by any means. But uh, I'd like to thank again the project team that that are here, uh, Adele and uh, and Steph for for giving that presentation. And we'll be around here a little bit if you want to come chat with us and ask questions or anything like that. But uh, thank you, thank you for listening to us uh, today. Thanks. Thank you, Sheldon, and thank you to everybody who presented throughout the day today. We do have some time here uh, before we wrap for the day. If there are any questions from any of the presentations, um, today we still have Sarah Longman with us. Tam is still with us, senior archaeologist. Uh, Sheldon and Stephanie and Adele still here. So um, if you have any questions, I know there was a couple we had chatted here earlier uh, before lunch. Um, so we, we do have the time to have questions or stories or, or some sharing. Um, there was a few comments earlier just from the presentations that we've heard today. So we can take a few minutes before we end if um, anyone wants to take advantage of the time that we still have. And if we do so, we just ask that we use the microphones around or if you wanted to, you know, presenters wanted to come up to answer, that would work really well. Yeah, it's been a long day. It's been a lot of information, um, a lot to consider, a lot to take home with us. We've got a question here. Yeah, I have a question with um, Red. Um, I went there in 65, uh, 65 Street, and there was a uh, uh, in your research. Do you look at staff and how they turned over? Is there was uh, there were stories that uh, uh, one of the one of the nuns got pregnant by. But one of the senior boys there, and he didn't come back in uh, 65. But so is that kind of uh, information in terms of staff turnover at the school on the boys' side and on the girls' side? So, hello. Okay. So, uh, yes, staff turnover is is uh, definitely something that the, that we're going to look at. Um, there is former staff who are starting to come forward now. They're actually feeling comfortable in, in coming forward and, and giving us their experiences when, when they work there. The direction that they were given uh, by the administration of the day, you know, the old ways, the great nuns, and things like that. Stuff that they were actually uh, they had to sign confidentiality agreements that certain works that they had to do while they're on the grounds they could never speak about uh, so we're very interested in uh, in finding those those documents um, if they are in fact documented uh, right now at this point i'm not too sure how well documented a a non meeting uh impregnated by okay if there's some information Hi, <laughs> I'm another researcher, sir, and I'm actually doing years 1961 to 1963, but so far when it comes towards nuns and um, for your question to stay, turn over on the boys and girls side. For now, I've only gotten their names, their date of birth, or the nuns, the nuns' names, the date of birth, and how they died, and some are still living today, but I still haven't gotten to any, um, the turnover part yet, right? Yeah. But I'm slowly getting there. <laughs> There's a lot of work. There's a lot of things for me to read and retype out and be thorough about or thorough, like read it over again, basically. But yeah, <laughs> eventually I hope to answer that more more details for you, sir. And what's your name? Eddie Good. Eddie Bitter. Eddie Bitter Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Can I ask you to come to a, a microphone at the front here? Thank you, appreciate that. I can't give it up now. <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, in terms of uh, some budget stuff, uh, like athletics and stuff at the school, uh, from 19, uh, 
51 to 1955, I think that uh, the Red Indians were Saskatchewan Indian uh, or Saskatchewan Junior A uh, champions. In 65, uh, 66, uh, the major team was a, uh, the South Saskatchewan uh, Provincial Champions. Uh, in, uh, in 60, 61, I think, uh, the, uh, the Red Indian uh, basketball team were Provincial Champions. Uh, do you guys look at that kind of stuff too? When we're accessing information and data and everything like that, right now it's a whole bunch of information that we're trying to sift through that just deals with uh, a student, uh, that student's information, when they went to school there, uh, if they if they left or if they passed away while they're at the school, uh, those types of things you know, for 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 now. So Adele had mentioned that. We went to the Oblates and the Green Islands archives in Montreal this past summer. And when we went to the archives there, they gave us a lot of access to the records that they contained for QIRS. And it just so happened that some of those records were actual newsletters from the school. So we have information regarding past students. We have a lot of the newsletters that, that talk about the different student events that happened at the school, like the provincial championships and things like that. So as the researchers are doing their, their uh, documentation and the digitizing of the documents, we are definitely coming across that kind of information. We're coming across all sorts of information when we go through these different documents. So one of the, uh, I guess, messages that uh, that we want to send out there from our own experiences is that your project IRS team, uh, their research component that has to be almost a group unto itself, just because there's so much information that, that they have to go through, they have to investigate the entire history of, of the school, what happened, you know, the activities, the, everything that took place in there. Uh, and, it, and it's all not just located in one central area. They gotta travel to this part of the country. They gotta travel over there. They gotta travel over here. And they gotta sift through all that. And then depending on where you are, there's different rules that you have to follow when, when you're collecting information and, and whatnot. So um, a message to any project team that's starting up or if and from our experience, your research team has to be pretty big. Like we have what, about six, six individuals? on our team and that's not enough we're finding that's that's not enough uh, so in our new proposal we're building in uh, a broader uh, research uh, piece to that to, to help us out because there's a lot of information out there uh, and yeah and the translation of it too that's another thing too like it was mentioned here you know it's it's the old style french so anyone who has a modern, modern understanding of today's French, it's not the same. You, you need someone who's trained in that old style French to be able to decipher a lot of that, a lot of that information. So we're finding that challenging uh, as, as well. To, to uh, like uh, uh, Adele and, and Sherry, they they know a little bit. They, they can kind of pick through French a little bit, but you need someone that, that really understands that old. Old French, and that's just another challenge, right, to the to the, to the archives because you collect all this data, and then you don't know what it says, right, unless you you get it translated. So a lot of uh, challenges around that as, as well. So we also encourage uh, people who have stories uh, because stories is what got us to where we are today. They. they they told us the stories, they, they told us what happened in the experiences in the past, and, and they were given they were giving us locations, right? The stories say look here, the stories say look there. And so it's, it's very amazing that the stories and what we're actually finding are 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 merging, they're that they're coming together. So if you have survivors in your family that know stories, we really encourage them to, to go to their to their uh, IRS location, that, that team, 
if it's Lebrecht, then, then it's us, if it's Causes, if it's Gordon's, you know, find someone there uh, so that those stories can be documented because they, those, they, they really help in, in that whole process. Uh, it, it helps with search, it, it helps with the history, you know, it corroborates what, what happened in, in history. Uh, so that information is, is really, really valuable. So if you have someone who might be sitting on the fence and whether they want to share or not, uh, encourage them to, to come forward and share. Because what we're finding too is that elders in, in their final days, they, they decide, okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my, my story. Uh, it, it, and, and then that, that story becomes second hand or third hand because it's passed down right through, through the generations. So we don't have that many original first hand experience stories anymore. It's always someone who, who, who was told, you know, this is what happened to my muscle, this is what happened to my auntie or you know, someone they shared that with me. Those are the types of stories we're, we're getting now. So if you know of anyone who might have stories, encourage them to, to go to their IRS project team and, and share. I think I just want to expand a little bit on what uh, Sheldon uh, shared. Um, this, the stories that you may have heard are really, really important because they, they help to uh, connect um, a lot of the archival information that we have as well. And there's always questions in the archival information, and we hear stories, and then we kind of remember. But if, you know, I know it's very difficult sometimes for our family members to uh, share these stories, and it's even more difficult to ask them to write stories down. But I've heard so many stories, and I just I just can't remember where all of these stories came from because we've heard so many. But if possible, you know, if, if you could write them down on behalf of some of your relatives, that would be very helpful. It's also interesting when you talk to uh, some of your older people, uh, survivors in your community, some of them attended more than one of these schools. So you will have, I know in my community, we have uh, students and, and family members that went to Lebrat and attended Lebrat for a very long time um, and then switched to Muskelgan. Um, so they kind of moved around a lot, and, I, and I'm not sure why they did that. Um, sometimes it was because the students were a little bit more difficult. Um, as the years went on, it was the students who just moved with their families and they went to another school. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, variations as to the movement, but a lot of times your kids attended more than one, one school. I have a list here um, that I will leave with you. and You can take a couple copies if you know people in your community for the Regina Indian Industrial School. This is the uh, communities that were involved um, with the removal of the kids. And beside each of the communities, it has a number of students who attended the school. So this is a list that's important to you or your family members. I have several copies that you can take with you um, to, to see the impact. The thing about this list is you'll take, is, is, as you're reading down to some of these First Nations communities, some of these no longer exist. And they were either dismantled completely or they were amalgamated into another one of the bands. So even that history is really, really important to us as we're looking at uh, some of the names in here that aren't familiar anymore. Um, so there are some communities that Running Wolf, uh, don't know where that is or where that was. Uh, so that information is important for us as well. Um, the other one, Mini Guests. We don't know if that name was changed or if it was written down a long way and what the actual name is. So there's a whole bunch of different historical pieces here that we're still looking for as we do the work. Um, and then the last thing, uh, people that are doing this work, if you take a look at um, uh, the ledger that we have, they measure circumference. Now, one of the issues that we have in doing this work is we do not have access or cannot get access to any medical records. There is uh, legislation in place called HIPAA that prevents um, any kind of access to anybody's medical records for a period of 100 years. So that's a really, really difficult uh, barrier for us to try to deal with. But, but, here's the big but, the Saskatchewan uh, Lung Association, uh, who was involved with uh, tuberculosis back then, and you can see that they were measuring the circumference. Uh, there is a way to access some of that information working with the local lung associations, um, because they did collect some of that information. 
and they do have access that we don't have access to. So that's kind of one of the new developments that, that we came across um, is, is finding out uh, through working with our own associations. Uh, the other piece, uh, Della had something she wanted to share. <laughs> so come on down to grab a mic, Della. Um, I don't know if you can see me now. One of the things that I've been doing over the past oh, I know, a couple of decades now is being involved in archival research. And I had an opportunity a couple of decades back to work with the Office of the Treaty Commissioner on the Treaty of that Entitlement. And so back then we had an opportunity to access all the payments up until 1955. And then we also created the tracing sheets, which we had to document every man, woman, and child um, that belonged to that First Nation. I believe there's about 30 First Nations who uh, fall on the treaty land and town claim. And so uh, the land was allocated for every family of five, I believe. And so that created the short form like this. But what it also did, because we had to sort of follow the money for the financial records, is to identify every man, woman, and child. And so when a child is born, the obligation is also um, put on the crown to give us our, our treaty payments or our five dollars. And of course that obligation ends when that person or a child dies. And so when you um, evacuate financially, uh, even in, in terms of the school records, et cetera, that financial obligation is there as that treaty obligation is there, but also uh, when that student is registered in the school because that transaction has to um, be paid to the school for that uh, child's education. Um, but again, that obligation um, begins and ends when that child dies. But also part of that uh, process was recording uh, the student um, uh, residential school number. And so I gave the example of uh, the QIRS so if you have in your residential school, and that number that gets traced. Um, and so if some of you got the bands, should still have access to your treaty pay list and your tracing sheets that would have established your treaty land and college. So it might be a couple of decades, but theoretically all that research is done. And so it also might be with your current land items. Now, um, and of course, the other part too is um, there were, if you're tracing sheets, they're also put into group records or family records. So, you know, you'll have, for example, Kisikus, and Kisikus is all their offspring or, or um, genealogy for, for the most part. And you could start tracing the whole family um, back. And then it doesn't, um, in terms of our GPR, et cetera, it doesn't identify the exact grade site, but it might, with anecdotal stories, et cetera, kind of um, indicate where they might be buried. So, for example, with the Sioux Valley uh, or Brandon School, uh, Sioux Valley First Nation has put their records uh, online, or you have to join the membership, um, but you can access some of the records, and they're sharing their records. And so, on that, um, their findings, I found one of my uncles who was buried at, res at the residential school there. So it, it's kind of interesting in terms of finding that out, and also the different spellings. Um, so in the tracing sheets uh, for the tailings, you may have half a dozen or so there varieties or variations of the spelling of Kisco Stark and Santa So we have all these different spellings and enunciations of Santa as well. Um, and then it, it kind of lets you know where to go looking for them in terms of where they may have been buried. So we have some at um, Bristol Brad and, and uh, the Regina Industrial School as well. Um, and, and so that helps you uh, track them down. Um, the other part that we've been working on, as I kind of digress a little bit here, 
is we have a working agreement that hasn't been signed yet with the Regina Archdiocese and looking at those source documents. Um, so hopefully we'll get that signed in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the Lori Warren at FSIN, if you don't have your access to your pay list, which is really interesting. So the pay list, um, your treaty pay list or your UVs, um, we can only access them now till 1923. When we did the TLE, we had a, were able to access them to 1955, which is, you know, I think the great case precedent, case precedent was set in that we should be able to access them up to 1955. And then you could use those and um, those records or fill in the gap with your membership uh, list as well. Uh, but Lori Worm at FSIN should help you with your um, band council resolution. So you, and they have researchers in Ottawa that should be able to access your uh, UD pay or your treaty payments um, uh, at the National Archives, which are, for the most part, you want to access most of the RG tents, the record group tents that contain not only the payments, but more probably the agent um, reports that they have to send in on regular basis. Um, the other place that um, is, of course, the Oblate records that we've been trying to access as well. A lot of those Oblate records are in French. And so one of the issues that I've been kind of managing is that I will go to a French interpreter and say, should I have this officially translated into French? Otherwise, you could use the Google translation. But if there's something with you know, trying to track down a perpetrator or maybe someone that looks like a perpetrator, you may want to have that um, special translation because of the um, uh, colloquialism that's uh, in Saskatchewan. So it's not quite Quebec law or Parisian French, but it's a little bit different. Um, so that might be a little cost uh, factor. On that note, I did ask, uh, we did ask um, with our funders if we can amend our, our agreement. Uh, and that, I, there's some funding issues that I have, they said yes, I could. And of course, then funding into 2025 uh, in the case that we don't get finished with our archival research. But for the most part, because of that prosperity or into perpetuity, we're digitizing everything. So we got the equipment to digitize and we're going to house it at the National Center for the Reconciliation, but we're also going to keep hard copies as well and create a resource center for our school and for our, the history on the case in particular. Uh, and also I've been looking at all models of how they recorded for grade in terms of like curriculum and going forward. I've also contacted one other point uh, in terms of the ground penetration radar and that confirmation. So I've been in contact with a forensic um, archaeologist who consulted on the victim and also the missing women in Winnipeg in terms of how not to disturb the ground, but how to confirm the GPRs that there is actually remains under there. And she did come up with about five different uh, uh, recommendations on uh, sort of identifying that there are human remains in that area. Okay, so that's my report. Thank you very much for bringing me on this slide. Thank you so much for sharing all of that information. You know, just like Michelle was, was referring to, like, we have so much information in our communities, right, to share about these things. So thank you. Appreciate that. And one other thing. We also been in contact with Chushwa, and so they were ahead of work it. So, but they have a, a spreadsheet that they developed, but they also have a model for the uh, shared agreement uh, that they've used with other First Nations in their area. And so collectively, I thought we could also share when uh, we find something we share it uh, with the other First Nations and say, oh yeah, here's some from my identification of some uh, of our records uh, for your community. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a question here as well. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peter MacArthur from Cousin Ralph. <clears throat> so you've uh, I guess I was there and moved over to White Bear in 1901. And prior to that, we were a separate Nakota band, and the Ocean Man was next to us, and they got moved over to, and we become part of White Bear. And during the years, in the early 1900s, 
the chief at that time at White Bear made sure that it, all the Assiniboines or Nakotas were sent to residential school. Those are uh, in the uh, files of Indian Affairs. <clears throat> Well, in 19, after the, like 1906, 1908, we have, my dad has three siblings that never made it home from the <clears throat> And today I'm wondering if there's anything, anybody here that can help us locate where they might have, might have went or where they were placed. <clears throat> also, after that, I come from a family, I'm the youngest of all. My mom and dad both went to residential school. My dad went to the Brett, my mom went to Brandon. And all my brothers and sisters went to the Brett. So that's 95 or 98 percent of our family, and I think everybody knows. Pedernum is almost all one family now, and and all the other MacArthur families on there, they all went to La Trappe or uh, St. Phillips. So it was, um, I guess, quite devastating to our our tribe, our band, in terms of losing the language and our culture. And we don't have many people that have still that have dealt with their issues from residential school, and so it's hard to get them to get up and talk about it. And uh, so some of these issues are becoming multi-generational people just holding in their issues, you know. And, uh, we're about these age old uh, habits of men who try and stuff like that. <clears throat> but sooner or later, we're going to have to deal with it. And uh, one of the other things we we're concerned about, or Asia was concerned about, was this last minute arrangement for this gathering. We would appreciate more time next time. I was only one available and ready to come. Yeah, like I said, we got three, three uh, people that didn't make it home from the breath that we know of, and there's, I guess, three from the Regina Industrial School. And one, uh, I'd like to introduce my advice to uh, uh, Starbank for a would it be easier to have, uh, instead of just having the two girls here, there should be funding made available to each reserve to have at least two researchers to handle their people so they're known. And sometimes, like, we found uh, like a lot of our files or treaty fields from the 1800s are all in our Nakota language. So we'll, we'll have our own people that but translate those into the present day names. Anyways, let us know what we're doing next time. And thank you. Good day. Thank you. So, uh, just like uh, how I had mentioned before, you know, uh, some questions will take some time to, to answer. There's, there's a lot of information to go through. There's a lot of uh, student uh, registries, nominal role, you know, uh, different uh, different documents that we have to we have to sit through, and we have to do that for three different schools. Like I'm just speaking for for our site, uh, so there's records and documents and everything that are, that are attached to those to those three schools. So figuring out a loved one and what school they went to, in what era, uh, what grade, you know, uh, it, it'll eventually all all match up. 
but uh, if you come to me today and say, okay, I, I had a loved one that, that, that didn't come home, they, they went to school around here, um, that's good information to know, and that's something that we can watch out for. Uh, but, but the research team, like I said, um, they can only work with uh, with what they have. If we have six researchers, uh, it's a ton of information that we have to go through. And like I said before, that takes time. Once we kind of figure out who went to school when, then we can start categorizing categorizing that by nation, by First Nation. Okay, this group of of people went to school from from this community. This group of people went to school from, from that community. It, it takes a lot of time to process all that information. This is why uh, I asked for some 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 patience because it's it's going to take some some time uh, to to go through that process. And we only have uh, the funding dictates how much we can do. Uh, so every IRS is going to be different. Depending on the proposal you submit, depending on your budget plan you submit, will determine what type of dollars you get to do that to do that work. Because when we first started this, when IRS first started this, whatever project you you came from, there was no consideration. This is new thinking. We didn't know how to put a plan together because we didn't have all those considerations. But we told the government, neither did you. Because the original amount that the government offered us was $200,000 to do this work. Total. That's, that's what they initially offered us. For, for a three-year three -year project, here's $200,000. Do what you can out of that. And everyone who has an IRS project knows that that's, that's nothing. That's, that's a, a couple of weeks' work with, with, with a GPR. If, if that so it, it so our project team counter offered with a different work plan and a different uh, budget plan and even then we didn't think about everything we're we're reorganizing our budget plan now because we have that much more experience uh, all the other stuff we didn't consider about in the first plan we're considering now we're extending our timeline uh, but yeah long long winded answer short is that we need time to figure out who belonged where, uh, and we can't do that unless we have a more, I guess, uh, intrusive investigative approach to those people when 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 we confirm there's an unmarked grief. Because right now the direction is that we don't bother them. We can look for them and we can determine if they're there. But we're not supposed to water them. And if that's the case, then, then that's the case. And then at that point in time, we we may not know who those are laying in the ground. We just know that that's somebody. That's that that may be as far as we're able to go, depending on the on the current direction that we that we have on on that. So there's a lot of community consultation that we still have to do. Since the announcement in January, uh, we need to return to our community to see if that direction is still the direction. If it is, then, then we have to tailor our our next steps uh, according to that. So a lot of a lot of things to talk about, a lot of things to consider. Uh, but yeah, uh, there are a lot of requests like that. Uh, so so it didn't didn't turn. Uh, come back, we don't know what happened. You know, so is it possible that one of those people that, that we find is that is that them? That's that's a that's a hard question to, to answer at this point. But but we'll work we'll work towards that. So that's why I'm asking for patience. It's not a, a quick answer by, by any means. And it's 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 the same answer that we have to answer for each and every person that we're going to find in the ground. There's a whole other different stuff we have to consider if we get permission to continue with uh, with DNA analysis and, and forensics and things like that. That's a whole different 
piece of this project that we have to consider. Because now we're looking at DNA collection. We have to collect DNA for, from each community that had students come to the to bread. And then we have to do DNA analysis of who we find. And that takes time. So there's there's data security. There, there's data storage that has to be considered around that because that's there's privacy around, around those types of things. There's lots of legal questions that we have to make sure that we that we satisfy just to find out who who a person is. Lots of things that we have to consider, not just our site, but every other every other IR site that, that has to. We're all going through those those questions now, and all those considerations. What do we do? How do we do it? How do we get the funding to do it? So, we're just starting. We've we've only scratched the surface, and it's going to take a long time. It might be the younger ones that are in grade school right now that might be continuing that work. That's that's how far along we're, we're projecting things like that to, to happen. But we're working on it. And we'll just continue to work as best as we can. Right now we have one full-time researcher, one part-time researcher, and four uh, student student researchers that, that come on from May to August of each year. And, and that's not enough. Mm -hmm. So, just a few minutes after. So, long-winded answer to, to something. We're working towards it. So we'll get there, but uh, have patience with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have one more question here uh, from um, from Sharon from um, earlier uh, from Sarah's presentation uh, this morning when we first started. Uh, and I think it had to do with clarifying the years of the of the school that you were discussing, like what years it was in operation. Is that right? Yeah, we're very first home on Gordon. First uh, we get burnt down. I am really terrible with dates. <laughs> I know the first school was built in 1888. And if you remember the um, the screen where I showed the different schools, it was that first one that was further away, close to the highway there, um, is was where the first building was. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, Eddie, do you know the dates of the first school? Okay. We're still working on that too. Okay. There, there was about five years where the school was uh, operating, but they didn't have the water. After they built the new 
Well, thank you, Edward. Thank you for sharing that information on that, and, and thank you, Sharon, for asking. And, you know, again, it goes to show like there's so much to put together here, so much information as to who went where, what years, what happened, for how long, you know, and, and even the personal stories, like Michelle was saying, and some of the personal stories of survivors bringing that forward. Um, you know, I know the years that my mom was taken to residential school to the Scouten, but I don't know at what years she went because we don't always, you know, talk details about some of these dates and just how much information there is still to to share and uncover and, and time and, and funding for some of the work that needs to be done. So, so with that, thank you for the questions and the sharing and the commentary. I'm glad that we were able to do that at the end of the day. Um, it's been a long day. And I, I thank each and every one of you for coming out here this morning, taking your time to be here, uh, to be here fully for all the presentations and to, to share here. I want to thank everybody who shared, um, Chief Michael Starr, who's had to, to leave, but brought welcoming remarks this morning, um, presentations from Sarah Longman on the Risa Cemetery search um, from um, Cal Young for um, his presentation with uh, George Warden IRS and the video that we were able to see. Uh, Tom Wynn, thank you. Senior archaeologist and the Star Blanket Cremation Search Team, thank you to Sheldon Petra and to uh, Adela Stephanie. Thank you so much for all of the knowledge, all of the research, all of the sharing um, that you brought. Uh, it's a lot, um, it's a, and it can be heavy. Um, but again, it's also very sacred, meaningful work. You know, our, our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, those before them, and the work that we're doing for our children and for the future. So I uh, just want to thank everybody for those presentations. I also want to give other thank yous and acknowledgements for uh, those who made today possible for all the work that we're doing. Uh, a thank you to the Regina Indian Industrial School Commemorative Association, Risa, and members for all of the dedication to the ceremony and the ongoing protection of that. To the members and community members who started this sacred journey so that we could pick up where you left off, we say a special, deeply heartfelt thank you to you as well. Uh, to the grandmothers, our life givers, uh, Cecile Ashton, Kokum Diane Katswadam, Valerie Ironchild, Susan Bowden, and Sylvia Obi. Your prayers keep us strong. Thank you so much. Um, our friends and community partners at the Presbyterian Church, uh, city officials and allies, um, you, you help us much more than you know in, in many more ways than you realize. And also a special thank you to Sus Culture for making today possible. Uh, thank you so much for that support. Um, on behalf of Star Blanket Cree Nation, uh, Star Blanket Cree Nation would like to acknowledge as well um, the Cowessis IRS team, FSIN, FHQ, uh, the Tribal Council, Axiom, uh, former students who shared their stories so far. Very special thank you to you, um, to the Archdiocese of Regina, and the File Hills Police Service as well. And finally, um, lastly, to survivors and intergenerational survivors. We are very deeply honored to do this work, and we will continue to find the answers you need. We will continue to ask for all, of that, all that you need, and we will always protect and remind people of our little ones and continue to do this work with, with good faith, with, um, to do it in, in a good way, and, and to do it for the benefit of our communities, for those who are no longer with us, and, and for those that uh, are our future. So. Thank you all for being here today. Again, I want to acknowledge the pipe this morning for their prayers and hope that those prayers will go home with you as you travel. I wish you all safe travels back to your home fires and wish all of you blessings from today and that you take that back home and, and prayers that this work will continue in a good way going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Awesome work, guys. Awesome presentation.